Okay, no worries. Are you with Canada 2020? No, I'm with? Uh, I'm with my own organization. Oh, okay. Matters. <laughs> nice to meet you. I'm Matt. Nice to meet you too. Good morning, everyone. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Welcome back to the first inaugural Canadian Open Dialogue Forum. We're very happy to have you all with us this morning. I see lots of familiar faces and some new ones. So for those of you who weren't able to join us yesterday, you have our welcome. I'm Olivia, and I'm going to be your Master of Ceremonies today. And as usual, I'm going to run you through the housekeeping before we can get it started with the exciting stuff. So. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to remind you all to connect. Engagez-vous. We will all be tweeting with the hashtag CODF16, and we would love to hear any thoughts, comments, questions that you have over the course of the day. Our wonderful team up front will be engaging using Facebook, Twitter, I believe they're YouTubing, so any way that you want to connect with us, we would like to connect with you. This conference is, after all, about open dialogue. Alors, je vous encourage fortement de participer avec nous aujourd'hui. Next, a big thank you once again to our sponsors. First, to Open Text. We would not be here without them, so thank you, thank you, thank you. We would also like to thank our government partners from the Government of Canada and Le Gouvernement de l'Ontario. Uh, finally, we have our collection of other wonderful sponsors here, including Google, Facebook, and IBM. On vous remercie infiniment. Uh, a couple final housekeeping notices for those of you who weren't here yesterday. The Wi-Fi code is CODF2016, password OPEN2016. And aside from that, you should be in good hands. Si jamais vous êtes francophone et il vous faut quelque chose, n'hésitez pas de venir me voir. Uh, and with that, it is my great pleasure to introduce once again our fabulous co-chair, Mr. Wayne Waters, former clerk of the PCO and currently of McCarthy Terrio. Well, I've been called many things, but never fabulous, so uh, thank you very much. Bonjour à tous et toutes ce matin. Hello, everyone, and welcome to day two of uh, the, Open Forum, uh, the Open Forum Conference. Uh, we have another exciting agenda today, uh, some amazing speakers, and uh, we'll start with our keynote uh, from Ontario's Premier, Kathleen Wynne. Premier, welcome here this morning. Um, Let's give a round of that. And that will be followed by breakout sessions and then another keynote from jo Joseph Powell, who is uh, from the Open Government Partnership. And after lunch, uh, we'll host a, uh, a leaders roundtable uh, to discuss our draft principles again, to continue to move those forward. And then there'll be further group discussions following that to further uh, dive into these principles. And we will also have, as we did yesterday, uh, more open ask sessions throughout, throughout the day as well. And I, I think it was really good to see the interaction uh, yesterday through our open ask uh, sessions. They worked very, very well. Uh, and so before we dive into our agenda, Minister uh, Matthews and I thought that uh, it would be good to share with you some of the uh, some of the observations and uh, that we got through the open ask yesterday. So, 72 percent of respondents identified as public servants. Great to see. Uh, and when it comes to motivations for participating in an engagement exercise. Influencing outcomes and making positive change was ranked as the most compelling reason, which is great, right? <laughs> While fulfilling democratic responsibility was ranked as the least compelling reason. Not following through on feedback, of course, I think this has always been a concern, not following through on feedback was identified as the biggest threat to public engagement process. You know, if governments are going to launch open dialogue, citizens who participate expect a response to what governments have heard. And 78% of the ideas you submitted address the theme of cultural change. So I think these are tremendous insights and they will 
help us finalize the principles, which is going to be a key outcome from, uh, from this conference. So today we're going to build on your ideas. We're going to further explore the draft principles, as I said, and engage in some deep dive conversations around open dialogue. It's an ambitious agenda, so let's get started. It's now my pleasure to introduce to you Patrick Corgan. Patrick is the Vice President of Manufacturing, Development and Operations at IBM Canada. Please join me in welcoming Patrick to the stage. Well, I think you're fabulous, Wayne. Uh, so, thank you very much, and uh, congratulations, by the way, on the theme of the conference. I, I think this is really an important topic, open dialogue. And, and I'll say that uh, from my perspective and from our perspective at IBM, the, the open dialogue and open innovation are, are closely linked in my mind. So, I will just try to make that analogy for you, and I hope that it, it works. Uh, uh, but because I think that when you're actually getting more input, our belief is when you're innovating collaboratively, you're getting diverse input from a number of different sources, you're making better solutions. And that's just absolutely true. Evidence shows it, and every other thing shows it as well. So um, from our point of view, in fact, I'll even say it this way, that we were a closed organization. When I first joined many years ago, I had black hair then, so just to let you know. But back then, if you think about uh, where we were, and we almost went through a near-death experience, we have to say, and part of it had to do with this theme. Uh, when I arrived, we had just done this, invented, we think, part of a, a new paradigm, which is the personal computer. And prior to that time, the personal computer or any other computing um, platform was very closed. It was hidden from view. And we opened up that platform and said, here's how it's made. Here are all the components. Take a look. You can uncover it. And if you think about it, there are many companies that are very famous today that built their future and their success on doing that, building those components themselves, perhaps doing it a bit faster and cheaper than we were, or doing the software platform beside it, or if you think about it, there's a number of companies that you could, uh, you could name yourself. And it really did, and in history is showing that it actually really did accelerate um, innovation in that way. Today, when we're looking at the Canadian uh, spectrum and the Canadian landscape, Open innovation for us is something where we actually think the partnership between government, academia, and business can really lift all boats. In fact, change the dial of where we were feeling like we're behind on innovation. We do a lot of investment here, but we never get it to the commercialized side. Well, we're actually seeing some momentum being pulled, and, and the formula actually doesn't only say, okay, well, let's put those three partners together. You actually have to think about doing it in, in a couple of other ways, with an open IP policy. In other words, saying if you bring in something as a university researcher or an academic, you are actually going to gain at the back end of this and hopefully help to commercialize and become very rich. Uh, if someone was doing that in a way to say, let me understand your IP so I can take it over from you, wouldn't work. And so there's some rules, there are some thoughts in there that actually, it's not only about opening, it's also about enabling and helping to commercialize and using uh, some of the skills that you have or that you can enable, and, and that does apply here, I think, to the open dialogue concept. We've seen that formula work ac across the country. We're very proud of that. We have partnerships that are uh, span from uh, coast to coast. But we're very proud, and it's important for me to be very proud of the work that we're doing here in Ontario. And I think you've uh, probably heard of something called the Southern Ontario Smart Computing Innovation Platform. That was coined by the 15 universities, not coined by IBM in this case. But uh, this is something where for the last four years, there's a huge platform now, a sandbox, where uh, the universities can actually provide their research and we help them pull through to commercialization. In fact, spawning thousands of new jobs in research, but more importantly, commercialization. There's 40 new companies and that's starting to become something of a success. And actually, the Ontario government just recently, about a month ago, in, uh, announced the Ontario Incubation Initiative. And it's something that is supporting the incubators in the province and using that same catalyst, if you will, towards open innovation that we did at the university level towards the incubator community and Communitech and the One Network and others and Invest Ottawa here. And I know Premier, you're going there later on this morning because I was with Bruce yesterday. So, you know, this is, this is kind of uh, a great exercise for us to say open innovation, open dialogue, 
more input does lift all boats. And, and I think that's really part to, of the theme here. And so if you, I'll come back to the beginning. I think that open innovation is a lot like open dialogue. And so if you think about those two things, uh, you'll be able to move to the future very quickly and think in new progressive ways about how to, uh, how to win for Canada against uh, the competition, which is the global economy, right? So, if, so with no further ado, uh, let me introduce the person who will introduce our keynote speaker and our co-chair, our fabulous other co-chair, um, to, uh, to the conference co-chair. So the Honorable Deb Matthews, the Deputy Premier of Ontario and the President of the Treasury Board. Over to you. And thank you for those fabulous remarks. Uh, I am delighted uh, to be here today to introduce my, my friend and my colleague, Ontario's Premier Kathleen Wynne, and delighted that we are joined this morning by four more members of our caucus, uh, Bob Shirelli, Marie-France Lalonde, Madeleine Mayer, and John Fraser. You know, we hear a lot that uh, if we're going to make progress on, on open government, we need the political will to do that. You're going to hear from the Premier that we have the political will. The fact that four more members of our caucus have joined us demonstrates even more political will. So welcome. We are delighted you're here. So Premier Wynne is the province's 25th Premier, and I'm proud to say the first woman to serve in that role. What you need to, yes. <laughs> So there are many things I could uh, say about our Premier, but I think what's most relevant for today is that she got involved in politics because she wanted a voice heard. Her entree into, into politics was through being a parent advocate in her, uh, in her kids' schools. So that notion that we need to hear the voice of the public is something that, uh, that the Premier knows very, very well indeed. She has a very long and strong history of participation in citizens' groups, grassroots community projects, and she knows and understands the importance of, having, of the citizens having a strong voice and role in, in government. And that's why, in 2013, she launched Ontario's Open Government Initiative to help create a more transparent, accountable, and collaborative government for the people of Ontario. And when she appointed me a president of the Treasury Board. She very clearly included in my mandate letter, which is publicly posted, that I part of my to-do list is making Ontario the most transparent and open government in the country. Now, we could achieve that one of two ways. Everybody else could get worse. Or we could get better, and I think what we're discovering over this conference is that we all want to move ahead. And uh, so I've got my marching orders to make that vision, aspiration, a reality. Premier Wynne recognizes that we live in exciting times where new technologies and fresh ideas can be harnessed to create powerful change and where governments must find new ways to inform and engage the people they represent. She wants Ontario to lead the way to make government information easier to find and understand, to use innovative models of public engagement to give Ontarians a greater say, and to unlock public data so that others can help us find solutions to problems and show us new ways of doing things. She believes in an Ontario where the public's input matters and where together we can do government differently and more effectively. And that's part of her plan to govern an Ontario where every voice counts. Now, I, I, also, um, I also want to say that uh, both the Premier and I, we have many parallels in our lives. One of the parallels is that uh, we each have three children. And another parallel is that our children are educating us on what all this means. And uh, I am delighted that one of the Premier's tutors her son, Chris Cowperthwaite, is here today, too. <laughs> so we're working hard to, uh, to catch up to the kids, and uh, we thank you for your guidance. 
So this morning, uh, the Premier is going to talk to us about what Ontario is doing to open up government and the important role that the province's new digital strategy is playing. Um, if time permits, and I think it will, we will be able to open up for comments, a few comments and uh, 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 advice and questions uh, at the end of her remarks. It is now my absolute pleasure to welcome Premier Wynne to the stage. Thank you very much, Deb, and uh, it's a great pleasure to be with all of you fabulous people this morning. <laughs> Bonjour, Annie, bonjour. I want to acknowledge that we're on the traditional territory of the Algonquin and uh, Anishinaabe peoples, and I want to recognize the long history of First Nations and Métis peoples in Ontario and show respect for them today. So thank you, uh, thank you, Deb, thank you, Wayne, thank you, Pat, thank you all of you for, uh, for being involved, for making this happen. It's a pleasure to be here with uh, Joe from the Open Government Partnership, Kevin from Facebook, Edwin from the OECD, and Don and Tim from uh, Canada 2020 for hosting this event. Thank you all for making the time to be here and to be part of this very important conversation. Um, and I know there are people from other parts of the country. Thank you very much for being here. As, uh, as Deb said, I think what we're doing here is we're all teaching each other about how to do this and how to move forward. And for years now, Canada 2020 has been an advocate for more open government. And I'm, uh, I'm pleased to be able to be here today to speak about what the Ontario government has accomplished, what we intend to do next, and to hear your, uh, hear your comments. Depuis plusieurs années déjà, Canada 2020 défend l'avènement d'un gouvernement plus ouvert et je suis heureuse de prendre la parole devant vous aujourd'hui pour parler de ce que le gouvernement de, de l'Ontario a déjà accompli dans ce domaine et de ce qu'il prévoit entreprendre. I know that you've already heard from uh, Deb, from Minister Matthews, who's been working diligently on the checklist of her mandate uh, letter. And she's been working passionately to advance our commitment to open government and, uh, and to better engage both citizens and organizations. I thought it was interesting, Wayne, the, the results that you, uh, that you talked about. Um, great outcomes. And, and interestingly, the democratic process wasn't as high up on that list. And so um, some of the things I'm going to say have to do with the democratic process and how important it is for me that we get those out Comes, that we are more open and that we engage more people in the process. So I want to today highlight some broad steps that we're taking to support our ambitious plan to increase and improve the ways in which citizens can interact with the Government of Ontario. And I want to let you know what you can do to help because Deb is absolutely right, we are teaching each other. Je, vous, uh, je veux vous présenter aujourd'hui quelques-unes des mesures, uh, des, uh, des mesures faires que nous avons prises pour soutenir notre plan ambitieux visant à développer et à améliorer les possibilités d'interaction entre les citoyens et le gouvernement de l'Ontario. So, the way I think about this, Ontario was once a collection of small agrarian communities and towns. Those still exist, but there was a time when pretty much everybody lived in, uh, in those small uh, agrarian towns. Everyone knew everybody else in their community. Politicians ran their constituency offices out of their homes. People had direct access to their politicians. But obviously, over time, communities have grown. It's become harder to stay connected. And I got into politics partly because I didn't believe that government was engaged or responsive enough to the needs of communities. I felt that, uh, that disconnect. So I'm really excited about what digital technology can do to help us to reconnect. Je suis notamment entrée en politique parce que j'estimais je, que le gouvernement n'était pas suffisamment à l'écoute des besoins de la population et qu'il n'y répondait pas de manière satisfaisante. Technology is not an end in itself, but it is a tool that offers us a way to bring people together and to help government better serve the people of Ontario. So 15 years ago, we, uh, the barriers that we faced in opening up government were both institutional and physical. 
in an analog Ontario, there were real limits to the kind of engagement we could undertake. So I consider myself lucky at this point to be Premier at a time when now the technology is developed to the point where open government's potential can actually be realized. And my end goal is simple. I want Ontario to become the most open, transparent and digitally connected government in Canada. That's our objective. Je veux que l'Ontario devienne le gouvernement le plus ouvert, le plus transparent et le plus branché au Canada. Openness and transparency can manifest in different ways. It might mean allowing government scientists to speak freely about their work and their findings or it might mean increased citizen engagement in policy development open, transparent, digitally connected. It's good for our democracy. That's, uh, I think that is a given. It can mean better public services and a stronger economy. In Ontario, we've defined open government in three ways. Open dialogue, open data, and open information. In Ontario, we have defined a government open de three façons. Une information ouverte, des données ouvertes, et un dialogue ouvert. Open dialogue projects like budget talks are including more Ontarians in the decision-making process. Open data means making data publicly available so that citizens and organizations can work together to create solutions that government hasn't traditionally delivered or hasn't even thought of. And I think that's the, that's the beauty of the, uh, the open data initiative. And open information means making it easier for citizens to access government services and key information that helps them then better understand how government works and how it can serve them. It's my hope and it's my belief that Ontario can truly lead the way in all of these areas. I believe we have the expertise, I believe we have the capacity to do that, and as Deb has said, we have the political will at this particular moment. We all know how exciting it is to live at a time when new technologies and fresh ideas can be harnessed to create powerful change. What we need to do is to bring that spirit of change to government. And that, in some cases, is easier said to done ju to, than done, just because of the, the culture and the size of, uh, of government and the demands, the day-to-day -day demands that sometimes get in the way. So to reimagine what's possible for governments in this interconnected world, to find new ways to inform and engage the people that we represent, and to reach out to a new generation of digital entrepreneurs and public servants who will help to deliver that change. That is our, that's our intention. Nous voulons trouver de nouveaux moyens d'informer et de faire participer la population que nous représentons et de miser sur la nouvelle génération de fonctionnaires et d'entrepreneurs compétents dans le, le, le domaine numérique qui nous aideront à réaliser cette trans transformation. So yesterday, Deb talked about some of the ways that we're working to do just that, about our open engagement projects that are leading the way in inclusive dialogue. She talked about how citizen, community stakeholder, and business feedback is actually shaping government policy in new ways. We know, and the truth is, that government has not always been good at listening. We get that. So today I want to highlight an engagement project that I personally advocated for and means a great deal to me. First, though, I'll give you a little bit of a, a background. For decades, and you will know this, uh, legislators have invited people from across the province to participate in a discussion over public finances. And in fact, we have a time-honored tradition of the Finance Committee traveling all across Ontario to meet folks face to face. And that practice is almost as old, old as the budget itself. And it's an important process to uh, go around the province. In addition to all that travel, the government has uh, for a long time welcomed written submissions from interested parties parties anywhere in the province. But with all that information collected and acted upon behind closed doors, some of us had come to the perspective that the process was exclusive rather than inclusive. And by that I mean people started to see it as only truly open to well-organized, politically connected groups or people who really knew how to take part in that particular process. So I wanted to fix that. I wanted to broaden that. I wanted to make this process more transparent and more open to better engage people in a meaningful discussion. 
As a platform then, the internet offered a way to do that. As a modern day commons, the internet allows us to meet people where they are. The reality of our world more and more is that people prefer to interact online. And you know, there's, there are lots of discussions about the impact of that, but that's the reality. So with that in mind, in 2015, the province launched Ontario's first digital budget town hall. And so Budget Talks was a, an interactive, real-time pl platform. It brought new voices to the conversation. Um, in that process, we had nearly a thousand new ideas and comments that were shared, and it went fairly well. We proved we could do a, a good job of fostering a discussion online. Parlant Bouget, une consultation interactive en temps réel, a permis à de nouvelles voix de prendre part à la conversation. But it was clear that it, we still had work to do. So, for instance, we weren't as successful as we could have been at showing people how their participation actually affected public policy. So from my perspective, there wasn't that loop that was closed in terms of people making the uh, submission and then understanding what happened to it. So, this year uh, we unveiled uh, an, an improved platform, we introduced more ways to engage and discuss ideas with different topic areas, and the, sp the response was enormous. More than 1,700 ideas were put forward, there were some 4,300 4, comments offered, and more than 53,000 votes were cast on those ideas. We also wanted to show that those comments and votes and ideas had real meaning. Uh, for instance, Ontarians made it clear that they wanted us to continue investment in areas like transportation, health care and education. And I'll just say there that I knew that this was possible. Actually, Deb said that our, our children tutor us. And and my son, who's one of my tutors on this, had actually shown me through an earlier process that we could have that kind of feedback loop on ideas and have that kind of, uh, that kind of policy discussion online. So we are, and we highlighted that alignment directly in our budget. We've, we've shown how that, uh, that loop can be closed. There were original ideas that came directly out of budget talks that became government policy. For example, replacing the traditional lighting we have along highways with energy saving LED lights. Ontario's already using LED lights on all new conventional lighting, but as a result of this push from the public via budget talks, we'll now launch a pilot project to test replacement of LEDs on high mass lighting on highways. So, very soon, those driving along the 401 by Renforth Drive might notice a change in lighting, a change for the better. Now, look, it would be naive at best to believe that putting a process online would automatically mean that people will naturally start agreeing with each other on what to do. I'm not suggesting that. Um, or that they will agree with what government is doing. Heaven forbid that. But that's not what we're aiming for. What we want to achieve with this process is the interaction, is the dialogue, a conversation that Ontarians can feel a part of and one that can show them that meaningful change does happen when people engage. That's the point of this. That's the point uh, to uh, changing these processes so that citizens taking part in their democracy and opening the doors that, uh, government opening the doors that have felt closed to them for so long. Il s'agit justement de l'objectif, amener les citoyens à participer à leur démocratie et à ouvrir les portes qui ont longtemps semblé fermées à beaucoup d'entre eux. And I know that we can continue to do better. Next year, we'll work to reform the budget consultation process further so that we can be even more inclusive and so that even more people have a role in shaping government policy. So being an open government, though, doesn't end there. There's a, a tremendous amount of data created and collected by government, and we think a great deal of it should be put to better use. And that's why through our open data directive, we've reached out for feedback from those people most interested in using that data. To make that happen, we leveraged an existing online collaboration tool. Ontarians were able to go online and use our collaboration document to help inform the directive that now governs release of the data they are looking to use. The goal was simple. The Open Data Directive is designed to maximize public access to data. That's it. We have uh, now the means to share data with people, and the way I see it, that means we have a responsibility to share that. 
The directive applies to data that's created, collected, and managed by all Ontario ministries and provincial agencies. So just to be clear, this doesn't apply just to one ministry. There's, there's information and data across government that, uh, that is of interest to people. And it's a, a binding document. This directive is a binding document that sets out key priorities and mandatory requirements for publishing open data for the public. So the Open Data Directive actually comes into force today. Uh, so this is a very important milestone for us here in Ontario because it marks the start of a new era for open data in the province. This isn't an overnight journey, as all of you uh, know, but it sets a solid foundation in place for an open by default approach to government data from uh, this day forward. La directive sur les données ouvertes entre en vigueur aujourd'hui. Il s'agit d'un événement mémorable pour nous en Ontario parce que cela marque une nouvelle ère en matière de données ouvertes dans la province. So to make sure that happens, the Government of Ontario is now required to make all data public that's not subject to certain legal privacy, security or confidenti confidentiality exemptions. So far, we've released 400 data sets. Some of the most popular are, not surprisingly, things that matter day to day, uh, to, day to day to millions of Ontarians. For example, you can go online and use Google Earth to instantly download a map of highway traffic cameras or local carpool lots. Researchers, app developers, and others are already using the information that we've provided to build apps for specific commercial uses for industries that need trusted data every day. So, for instance, the GridWatch app, which was developed by Energy Mobile right here in Ottawa. It allows users to track Ontario's electricity grid hour by hour, as well as plant by plant. And anyone can see how much power is being generated and how it's being generated. So what's the fuel type? You can even track carbon emissions. So that's going to be even more important as we move to reduce our carbon emissions. You're going to be able to look at, over time, how those changes are happening. Or Map Your Property, an app that's useful for folks in real estate, urban planning, or engineering in and around Toronto. It provides zoning and regulatory information and shows how things like environmental protection areas in 10 different municipalities, all in interactive maps. It was also developed by a team right here in Ontario. As I said at the beginning, being open needs to be about more than just improving the way government works or is perceived. It needs to improve people life, people's lives. It actually needs to make something better in terms of the way uh, people live in Ontario. And that's why my, top, my priority as Premier is to create economic growth and jobs. And it's why open data is so encouraging as part of that strategy. It's unleashing new economic forces and enabling new opportunities for people across Ontario. Ma priorité absolue en tant que Premier ministre est de stimuler la croissance économique et de créer des emplois. C'est pourquoi les données ouvertes sont porteuses de tant de promesses. Elles permettent l'émergence de nouvelles forces économiques et offrent de nouvelles possibilités aux Ontariennes et aux Ontariens. We're very pleased to know about all the ways that the data we're releasing will continue to be used. We're excited about that. We want to see, we want to see that happen. We even encourage folks to tell us when, when they use our data by including the hashtag, uh, hashtag open on, because we want more Ontarians to know when this information is easily accessible. We're happy with what we've been able to do with the release of open data, but we know that there is more to do, and we're eager to do more that will, uh, we're eager to do more that will need the help of people in this room. We need, we need your feedback. We need to understand um, what you're seeing. We need organizations to come forward who are willing to help and engage with us. We know that there's a culture that has to change. We want to continue to engage the community in a conversation about the data that they want so that we can prioritize it for release. So you're all a big part of this process, not just making information accessible, but making it useful for Ontarians in their lives. So I'm going to thank you in advance for taking part in that process. Open information was a huge part of our thinking about this, uh, this year's budget in another way. In our 2016 budget, we looked for ways to fundamentally rethink how the Government of Ontario delivers digital services in order to meet public expectations. 
So that is the third major plank in our plan, not merely to be more open, but to translate that openness into citizen accessibility. During the last decade, the explosion of digital technology has revolutionized entire industries from transportation to sales. And already in Ontario, nearly 90 percent of people use the Internet regularly to shop, to find information, to learn new skills and socialize. And it is understandable that we expect to connect with our government in the same way that we connect with everything else. I think that is a, a fundamental expectation of people. We want, we want to be able to connect with government any time, anywhere and on any device that, uh, that we might be carrying. We want to meet those expectations. It is not enough to simply put up uh, existing processes and information online. We fundamentally have to rethink how government programs and services are delivered in Ontario. Il ne suffit pas de mettre en ligne de données et processus existants. Nous devons repenser en profondeur la manière dont les programmes et les services gouvernementaux sont fournis en Ontario. We know that we need help and guidance on this. So on this piece as well, we need your help because, frankly, that's not the kind of thing that government is accustomed to doing or making. It's going to require change in our culture, and so we'll be looking for help from outside experts who have done this sort of thing before in other contexts. So, <clears throat> for example, we'll be uh, partnering with people who have expertise championing digital transformation in government. This year we will release uh, Ontario's digital, digital Government Action Plan and it will unveil a vision for transforming government online, including creating new digital service uh, office, an office led by a chief digital officer to drive change across government. And we will certainly be active in helping to cultivate the talent in the Ontario Public Service and finding new talent outside of government to help us achieve our goals. We recognized as, uh, as we got into this process and we recognized recognize Deb and uh, my colleagues that we needed to have an across government view that would allow us to draw on the people in each ministry that had an interest or had expertise and uh, understood how we can move forward. And so that is why that central office is important. We plan to work with groups like Civic Tech TO and Open Data Ottawa to engage civic minded technologists. And through internships and developmental opportunities, we will reach out to Ontario's colleges and universities who are helping to educate people with the skills that we need in order to uh, foster this change. I recently um, undertook a trade mission to California where I met with uh, the large Ontarian and Canadian expat community leading the way in Silicon Valley. I couldn't convince all of them to come home because they told me the weather was too good down there. But <clears throat> students with uh, skills that we need are leaving the University of Waterloo and our other institutions to work south of the border. I'm appealing to those people working in the tech sector who have a passion for civic duty to come and transform the way government interacts with citizens. Internally, we'll be hosting speaker sessions, training sessions, and ongoing engagement to make members of the Ontario Public Service part of the process. But we won't be able to better engage with the people we serve without the help of the public service. We know that, and uh, so we're going to set up those processes. Our action plan will serve as a public roadmap for Ontario's digital transformation, something that everyone all over the province can look to so that they know what we are planning to do. And the plan will set out new organizational standards and empower the next generation of digital talent. It will push government to deliver the best possible citizen experience. It will focus on identifying digital projects that can have the greatest impact in making government easier for people to access and improving how you engage with our government online. Nous nous efforçons de déterminer les projets numériques les plus susceptibles de rendre le gouvernement plus accessible à la population et d'améliorer la façon dont elle communique avec le gouvernement en ligne. And by showcasing our commitment to digital innovation, it will attract a new wave of investment in the IT sector, and that's good for the economy. To do this, we need to, uh, we need to build a government, uh, a leading government web platform. We know that citizens don't see and they don't particularly care about the structure of government. 
when looking for benefits information, they don't care whether it's the Ministry of Health or the Ministry of Children and Youth Services providing that service. They just want to get the in information as painlessly and as quickly as possible. So we're breaking down those barriers as we build Ontario's new website at Ontario.ca, a searchable single destination for government information. Ontario.ca, if you haven't uh, visited it, it's a user-focused, user-experience tested platform for accessing government information. And so far we've migrated nine of 28 ministries to the site. Although I have to say, and I say this to the people who are working on this, when I went on it, I looked at it, it looked to me like there were more ministries there than nine. But someone will explain to me how it's only nine, I'm sure. Um, I counted more than nine. Um, next, we plan to focus our attention on the public services that Ontarians are the most eager to access access online, like health care, post-secondary education, transactional services through Service Ontario. For instance, we'll bring all of Ontario's fragmented health information online into a world-class one-stop website for Ontario health care information for patients, families, providers and practitioners. Based on customer feedback, we'll continue to redesign some of Service Ontario's key services to make them simpler and easier to use. And we'll make it easier for students to understand their student grant eligibility and make it easier to apply for those grants, making the absolute most of our recent decision to overhaul student financial assistance in Ontario so that more young people are getting the right information and the upfront financial supports and the degrees and uh, certificates that they'll need to succeed. These projects are just the beginning. We recognize that. We want to go farther. We'll examine big digital changes as well, like exploring additional ways to put patients first and giving Ontarians better electronic access to their personal health information and creating a single online digital identifier so Ontarians can seamlessly access services and information online. We'll release further details about the projects in the coming months, but I hope this gives you a, a flavor of what we want to achieve. In order to accomplish our goals, we need to fundamentally reform the culture of government. Um, and I'm going to just pause here to focus on that last point because I've mentioned it a couple of times. Culture change is no small task. We all understand that. We have to remember that as a government, we have in some ways a monopoly on the services and information that we provide. In the private sector, People can vote with their feet or their wallets, but when it comes to your driver's license or your health, ca health card, um, there's no other supplier. You have to come to government for those services. Historically, within government, we've tended to work in silos that have, those silos, those walls have been between ministries, expecting that citizens will do business with us on our terms. And that fact can lead to a degree of complacency within government. Why not just keep things the way they are? Why go through the challenge of reform if there's no threat to uh, prompting, no threat prompting action? Why would we do that? So our goal, my goal is to change that, to encourage and set in motion a radical rethink of how we do business, how we interact. We need to do a better job of working collaboratively across government to meet citizens' expectations. And citizens are right to expect a lot from government, and we should be constantly looking for ways to meet those expectations. We want to fundamentally make life easier for people, and we have to design government digital services that put people first, that are user-friendly, and that are simple and straightforward, so that given the choice, people prefer to use them. Nous devons concevoir des services numériques gouvernementaux qui placent la population au premier plan et qui sont suffisamment conviviaux, simples et directs pour que, face à un, un choix, les gens optent toujours pour ces services. This can't simply mean placing existing information or even processes online. It means we need to fundamentally rethink how we deliver government to people here in Ontario. And I've laid out, uh, as I've laid out here today, we need to harness new technology to create meaningful change. We need change because to be anything but a digital forward government right now means you're simply not delivering the best possible government to your citizens. This process started as a big idea, to use technology to find new ways to inform people and engage them in government. And the more we do this, the more we put technology to work for people in government, the more ideas that we'll have. It will generate those ideas. The more we'll start thinking of new ways to make meaningful change. And the more innovative and effective government will be. Ultimately, the more innovative and dynamic 
our society will be. I believe that, that is how, that's how this process will work. We know that digital changes will lead to economic growth across the province. For example, the sharing economy has significant potential to drive economic growth, productivity and innovation. Sharing economy platforms now grow more quickly than traditional businesses. And that's because of the rapidly evolving technology that typically enables them. And that's why it seems to me that <clears throat> any, uh, any of us in our, this society who think that the sharing economy is something that we can ignore. And I can tell you, among some circles, that is, uh, that's a discussion. I think our uh, people are, we are kidding ourselves if we think that's the case. The fact is the technology is driving that part of the economy, and so we need to be ready to embrace it and work with it. In the coming months, um, the province will launch a more uh, targeted consultation to help determine the best approach for Ontario moving forward, including exploring ways to further enable home sharing and allow greater flexibility for ride sharing, that particular part of the sharing economy. We know that digital means a stronger economy, better public services, a stronger democracy. Nous savons que le numérique signifie une économie plus forte, de meilleurs services publics et une démocratie plus solide. It is a big task and it seems like a big task, but we can do it. We are doing it. You are, you are all doing it and it's working. So I want to thank you for helping to lead this change. And I will just say, <clears throat> I want to thank you because many of you are working with those of us who have not got the experience that you have, who need to be tutored, who need to be brought along. But if, if there's only one, one message you go away with today, we are willing, we are doing everything in our power to call on the people who can help us, and we're going to get there together. So thank you very much. Merci. Miigwech. <clears throat> <clears throat> Deb said I would take some questions and some comments, and she's absolutely right. I'd be happy to do that. If you ask me a deeply technical question, I will just throw it back to you. <laughs> but if you have a comment, and that might lead to me asking a question, that could be a very good thing. So uh, if anybody would like to uh, make a comment or ask a question about uh, where we're going, I'd be happy to hear it. I can't see you, really. There's, I can, okay, right there. And there's a microphone coming to you. Okay. Thanks, Thank Olivia. you very much. Um, Anne Gabriel, Public Health Agency of Canada. Uh, I'm a manager of um, seats and engagement. And I was curious about your, your virtual dialogue as part of the Ontario budget. And I'm curious to know, how did you close the loop with seats? Since you, know, you got a number of entries, feedback. How did you demonstrate? to citizens that um, their ideas were adopted, considered? Yeah, so people could see online the, uh, the ideas. The ultimate um, closing of the loop was the, um, the commentary in our budget that, that said how many, how many responses we had, what the ideas were, and where they were found in the budget. So what I said to our team was, I want people to know the things that they have talked about in that process actually found their way into the budget. So there actually is a section in the budget that shows um, the ideas that came from the, uh, from the consultation. I don't think it's still as direct as it could be. I think there's more that we can do, and that's, you know, we'll improve the process next year. But uh, it was very important to me that what people said was reflected uh, in the budget and that we, you know, we let people know that. Great. And, you know, the reality is that um, there were many things that we were working on that people commented on in the budget. So there was uh, the, the consultation process was also a validation of uh, some of the things we were already working on, but there were brand new ideas that we hadn't heard before. Is there a hand out there? Oh, hi. hi. Christine Putsey. Um, I've heard throughout these last two days a lot of talk about culture change. And certainly the discussions that we've had you know, in our, in the breaks and at lunch, all revolve around the need for culture change. So I'm curious as to what is the Ontario government's um, strategy and what actions will actually be taken to drive that culture change? Is it changing recruitment processes? Is it changing management style, leadership style? Like, how are we actually going to do it? Because without a doubt, it is the most difficult thing. Mm -hmm. And yet, 
we can't achieve any of what we're talking about over these last few days without that culture change. Yeah, I think that's a great question, and um, it is, it's a work in progress, I'll be, uh, I'll be honest with you. Um, but I think that is the prime driver between having this across government approach so that we can, we can learn from the, uh, the practices across government where there's a good thing happening. Because the reality is that there, there will be pockets of innovation that are happening in, in government or outside of government that we need to bring in and apply uh, across government. That's what the, the chief digital officer, that's what that person's responsibility will be, will be to drive and ask questions and uh, and push. So I think all of the uh, above, you know, the recruitment policies are going to be very important in terms of bringing in people who have these skills, being willing, being willing to take advice from the outside and to uh, to listen to what people are saying on the outside. And part of that is driven from the political level, you know, that, that we, uh, we have an expectation, we make that expectation clear across government. So we're working on all of those fronts to, uh, to make the change happen. So. We're good. Okay. So Caroline Phobes, I'm Department of Justice Canada. Hi. Um, hi. So, uh, just curious, when you went to the Silicon Valley, did you actually convince the techie geniuses to come and work for the Ontario <laughs> government? That's number one. Number two, so I'm at the Department of Justice, I'm a, I'm a manager, and uh, we're looking at ways to actually provide legal services in a more efficient and effective and, and sort of 2016 way. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, are you doing anything in the Ontario government to improve the delivery, or maybe not improve, but change the delivery of legal services? Um, has any work been done? And if so, I'd be curious. To find so out. I can't answer you specifically, but I can tell you that every ministry is being touched by this. So there's not, uh, there's not a sector that we're not working in. Uh, in terms of convincing that the tech geniuses to come home, literally a number of them said to me they're not coming home because of the weather, but, um, but they also said, you know, they went to Silicon Valley because of the ecosystem, the, just the critical mass of, uh, of opportunity there, and, and uh, a number of them did say they're seeing things happening in sort of the Ottawa, Toronto, Kitchener, Waterloo corridor, you know, they, uh, they're feeling better about what's happening here, and, and there's, more, there's more venture capital going into uh, innovation here in Ontario, so, so some of them said they were thinking about coming back. I think the I think the you know the reality is that there's a, there's a, a good exchange. There are numbers of them who have already come back. I've talked to many people who uh, spent some time in uh, in the states and then uh, and then come back to work here. But we're going to continue to have that discussion, particularly with uh, with grads who are coming out of uh, university now to try to to try to keep them here in the first place. Yeah. Hi. Right back in the corner. Hi. Hi, Joe Thornley. Um, you are about to get the geeky question, and I don't expect you to understand, but or, or oh, rather good. to respond right now. But if you would consider it, because I know, given where you are as the premier, the word from you to make it so will make it so. Basically, RSS feeds are fundamental to the democratization of the web, and I notice on the Ontario government website and the new on, uh, open government portal that there are no RSS feeds. Um, that's a big step backward. And if you could please direct the people on, who are developing your web to restore RSS feeds, that would be wonderful. Thank you. So, what's it? Okay. <laughs> Deb says fine. <laughs> as soon as I find out what an RSS feed is, I'll be on that. <laughs> I, <laughs> On that note, I am going to thank you all so much and uh, look forward to working with you in the days and weeks to come. Thank you. Merci, miigwech. Well, I know I'm supposed to answer the RSS feed question. I, I probably won't even. Uh, Thank you so much, Premier, and as always, uh, what a, you know, a really compelling uh, set of messages. And I just thought I'd, I'd capsule, I wrote a bunch of notes, but I'll pick open as my, as my uh, schematic here. So open, O for, Ontario definitely wants to be number one. And I think that's awesome. I think that, whether BC, I know David's here and some others, 
But it, just to put that out there and say we want to be one, number one and we want to lead, I think it already starts that culture change that you're being asked about in one of the questions. A lot of, and the P side, purposeful actions were being made. And I think, again, it's not just saying I want to do something. It's actually saying here's some purposeful reasons and things that we're doing and projects that relate to it. So two Ps there if you want. Engagement was uh, really the theme. Engagement of citizens, engagements of the public sector. And I think that's very, very important. And then finally, you did actually give us a new N for new. But so, you used new so many times in your, in your remarks that uh, the new open data today, uh, the new digital, uh, anyway, I can go through all of them. But I think it was very compelling to have all of those things in this open dialogue and actually driving openness uh, in the way that you do. And your own uh, manner is very open and you've been very much a listener to people uh, throughout the province and, and probably across the country. But, I know for a fact that we all think so, and so thank you very much for your remarks today, and uh, we're definitely here for helping you as well to drive this to the future. So on that note, I'm going to, here's another fabulous, fabulous is the word for today, but if you could come back up here and uh, just tell us what the next steps are. I think we're going to uh, breakout sessions, right? We are indeed. Okay, thank great. you kindly. All right. Here we go again, on to the next. Thank you very much, Premier. It really was a treat to hear you speak. All right, folks, we're going to head into our breakout sessions. Uh, for those of you who are following along on the schedule, uh, we're going to be shortening the time down to an hour long for your session, and we will still be going to our uh, health break at quarter two, so make sure that we see you back by then. In the meantime, for those of you who are looking for pod A, that is Fostering Open Dialogue, Canada's first public sector institution open, you can go just down along here. We're going to have volunteers who will direct you. Uh, there's also going to be Pod B in the same area, the open dialogue in the cities of Guelph and Ontario with Mr. Nassbaum and Ms. Pappert. Section C is going to be at the very back of the room. It is going to be civic engagement in BC with Mr. Hume. And for those of you who would like to stay put, stay comfortable in the seats where you are now, you can hang tight for Pod D, an open data perspective in open dialogue with Mr. Tour. So I hope you really enjoy your breakout sessions. On vous reverra ici après que vous avez fait votre pause. Bon courage.
All right, folks. I assume that those of you who remain with us are our pod D. If you, <laughs> bravo. If you don't mind, I'm just going to have you all move towards the front in the corner over here so that we can have a, a much tighter conversation. The room is fairly noisy with the other pods going on, so I'll ask you all to please come to the front and over to my right. We'll see you soon. On down. Good morning. Good morning. Hello. There we go. All the pod deers, hands up if you're a pod deer. Come on up. You, you, you can come a little closer. It's probably be better that way. And it, 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 it improves the dialogue if you get a little bit closer.
This way I can pick on people too, because then I can see your name tags and I can say, oh yeah, we need to hear from you. So, so good morning. Uh, my name is Kevin Tour. I'm with the Open Data Exchange. And i um, happy that you've chosen to uh, choose this particular breakout. And what, you know, what I'm going to focus on today, um, first of all, in uh, sort of the true theme of the conference, this is intended to be a dialogue. I, I tend to start to, uh, when I get started, I tend to ramble on. So if you need to stop me, by all means, go ahead. But what I thought I'd do is I'd set the stage a little bit for the first uh, 20 minutes or so in terms of around a couple of concepts around open data and open dialogue in particular. Um, and the premise that I'm, I'm building on is, is, a, is a couple of things. And first of all, I think we've heard over and over again that dialogue and open data do need to work uh, extremely closely together. And I certainly see that. But one of the premises I want to explore a little bit further with everybody here is um, how do we engage or more engage the private sector in the conversation? So I'm, I'm more of an open data guy than I am an open dialogue guy. So my focus, uh, especially through the Open Data Exchange, and I'll get into that a little bit later, is really about how do we get open data into the private sector in order to spur economic activity. And I know that in itself can be somewhat uh, controversial, but uh, that's one of the areas that I'd love to explore a little bit deeper. And the, the second part about all of this too is, and again, dialogue's an important part of that, is what's the value proposition? How does the value proposition fit into this in order to sort of support the, the dialogue, but also support the use of open data specifically. So those are the kinds of things we'd like to explore a little bit. Let me just uh, set the stage here. So in terms of the, where we'd like to go with it, as I mentioned, I want to draw a little bit of a connection between value and the dialogue itself to set things off. Um, and I'm going to look at a couple instances which I think everybody will be familiar with and where dialogue has acted or been used in order to enhance the value proposition to result in sort of an evolution of a process of our product. And then it's that third section, dialogue and open data. So I've got uh, some things that I'd like to ask you specifically about and get your feedback on. Um, I'll be the first to say I, 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 I'm, not, I'm not gonna say that I have all the answers, far from it. In fact, I'm looking for you to help us with some answers because obviously the whole open, di open data field and especially the commercialization aspects of open data are extremely new. And I'd uh, love your feedback on that. And then I'll tell you a little bit more about, uh, you know, if time permits, about open data exchange and our mandate in terms of going forward. So let's, let's start with some fairly fundamental things. So what is dialogue? I mean, essentially, it's, it's, it's a way to discover uh, ideas that can make something better. So whenever anybody engages in a dialogue, I think the intention of that dialogue is to, you know, maybe it's interchangeable with the, with the idea of negotiation. But in the end, we all feel that engaging in a dialogue will result in a better outcome for us or a better outcome for a system. And I think an important part of dialogue is sustainable relationships. So, and in other words, um, and again, it's part of negotiation in many ways is then through that dialogue, how do we come to a solution that's sustainable, that can move on, that provides value to all parties involved? And I think that's an important part of creating a good, strong value proposition. And then open da data di or open dialogue, and of course I ripped this straight off of uh, Open Canada. So this is obviously with more of a focus on how does that dialogue improve the processes within government and the ways that citizens engage with, with, uh, with government. And again, the primary goal of dialogue is that note of and what we're calling continuous improvement. So it's the idea of continuing the dialogue, making things better, uh, improving the value proposition, and again, coming back to that notion that the best solutions are those that are sustainable and results in value for both. So this is the connection that I'd like to draw between these various aspects, and I think I'm in the way a lot. So with dialogue, again, I think what we wanted to and what we want to try to get to is this notion of value creation. So as I look at open data and we look at open data, it's how can open data be used? And I know the, the Premier used that, uh, that notion in, in her remarks is it's less about making the data available so much as it is now about talking about through that dialogue, what's the value that's being created? Why are we doing it? 
And if you do that, in, in order to come up with a good, strong, fundamental focus on value creation, then obviously you have to have the way of measuring that value. So what's, uh, I, I'm going to use the term return on investment a little bit later on. But the whole notion is, why are we doing all of this? Which may be why we're, you know, sort of speak to the use of, of, of open data and open dialogue. But then the second part of that is, once you've done it, how do you know you're achieving what you intended to achieve? So how do you measure those sorts of things so you come with the outcomes? And again, these things, I think, work very closely together because without all of these things in place, then I believe that uh, you know, the relationships that we establish through dialogue will be temporary and there will be no sustainability. And of course, the, the best uh, solutions of, uh, are sustainable. So this is now where I'm going to get in a little bit into things that we've seen in the past where dialogue has been an important part of, of, of moving a value proposition down, uh, downstream. So who's familiar with Web 1.0? Anybody know what I mean by Web 1.0? OK. Well, there's a half a hand up. OK, I'll take it. I'll take half a hand for now. So Web 1.0, I'm, I'm old enough to remember when the uh, internet was created and first came online. And everybody was thrilled that you could get onto your computer and you could go out and search, or you could find things on this thing called the internet. And then soon thereafter, people realized that I've got a world audience. I've got a global audience. So why don't I throw my information up there and make whatever I'm doing, whatever matters to me, my business, my cause, available to the world? So then it became a web page. And wow, I could find out what was going on with all these things around the world by visiting a web page. But this web page, and even though it was new and novel at the time and it was revolutionary, it was a one-way transfer of information. It was essentially pushing information out with maybe this much opportunity to provide feedback on what that was, exactly what was going on. But again, at the time, the value proposition was strong because it was net new, it was revolutionary. We couldn't share information that way uh, in the past. And it created something that was disruptive and, and uh, significant value add. But would we all now be happy if the most that we could do with our web pages was download information. I think the, I hope that everybody would say no to that. We, we're now living in a society where we very much look at our web presence to be a way that we connect with other stakeholders. And I've got a couple, well, uh, three teenagers in my house, and uh, they're voraciously using these things all the time. And, uh, and, and, and sometimes I think, and, and sometimes they're having some sort of allergic reaction because they've got their phone in front of them and they make a strange face and then they click and what the hell are you doing? But that's the way they're engaging in their dialogue with their friends. It's just Snapchats and Pinterests and all these sorts of things. Um, and so now it's a way that we're using, we, we've moved the value proposition down and we've increased the dialogue. And it's now that dialogue between consumers and product providers and dialogue between government and the private sector. It's dialogue that's going on at an unprecedented rate. And you know, all you need to do is look at uh, probably the number of tweets and chats and, and things that have been going on through this conference to know that this is now a fundamental part of our lives and the way that we do business. And uh, another uh, great example happened to me last night. Uh, my daughter goes to university here. In, in Ottawa, so every chance I come to Ottawa, uh, or every chance I come to Ottawa, I, I, I take her up for dinner. So I met up with her. We had uh, we had a nice dinner, and then it was time for her to each to go her, her own way. So she pulls out her phone and uh, and she pulls up her Uber app, and uh, and you know with a push of a button, she's tracking the the, the the driver and where they are, and and the estimate is they'll be there in five minutes. Um, as a dad, I'm not really thrilled with my daughter using Uber for multiple reasons and things of that sort, but she's living her own life. But I went old school route. I said, I'm going to call a taxi. So I get out my phone, thinking I'm doing pretty good here. Um, I called three different taxis and was on hold for five minutes each time. When I finally did get through, uh, sir, that's going to be 35 to 45 minutes before they arrive. And so before I'd actually ordered a cab, she was in her Uber ride, she'd gotten home and she was texting me that I'm home and I'm on to my next thing. And I'm thinking, 
Okay, there's dialogue. There's, uh, there's something new. That's, that's the kind of world we're living in, and that's the kind of interactivity that we're expecting. So there is a good instance where, you know, these things didn't happen by chance. It all involved dialogue, and then now, as we can see with this, is extremely data-driven sort of uh, process. Now I want to look at another example, which is still evolving and still emerging in many ways. And this involves transportation. So we're starting back in the days uh, when the, the horse and, and, and buggy was revolutionary. And it was revolutionary because, gee, I didn't have to walk from point A to point B. I could actually get some animal to take me there. And there was a value to that. And then came along this thing called the horseless carriage. It's like, what's a horseless carriage? Well, not only, you know, now we can put the power of, like, 10 of these horses into an engine and we can get you from point A to point B and, and, and you can get there a little bit quicker and you don't have to stop to water and feed it and you don't have to clean up after it and everything's good. And it's, it, it moved the, the process along. And of course, it's, it's part of the Industrial Revolution and it was a huge part of how the world changed with the, with the advent of the automobile. But where are we going with that now? So now we're talking about connected car. Who knows, who's familiar with the connected car and what, what a connected car will do for you? Okay, a few in the room. Who has a connected car? Pardon? <laughs> so you may be connected, but you're not sure why? But it's fair to say that, okay, there you go. They'll figure it out for you, right? But the point of the matter is that's probably going to provide value for you at some point going forward once you figure out what, you, what it is that you're going to do. And you, you need, yeah, we all need our, our children to help drag us along. But that's the whole notion is the connected car is now connecting us to other people, other things, other services. And this is the evolution as, as we go along. So what we're doing is we're, you know, is, is we're increasing the dialogue as we move along here. Where it's not just a dialogue that we have with one another to improve something. It's now becoming a dialogue that we're having with inanimate objects and inanimate things and services and computers and things of that sort. And the sort of the end game and the end goal in, in the automobile industry will obviously be the connected car or the, or the driverless car. And so to me, this is, this is again, this is a showing how we're evolving how we're including dialogue, not only dialogue to create the solutions, but the dialogue that's ongoing in order to support and, and build that value proposition. And once we get to the driverless car, or even the connected car, then we'll probably be rather reticent to go back to where we were. I don't think anybody here has any interest in going back to the horse's carriage or, or a horse and buggy. Now, I'm from around the Waterloo region, and we see horse and buggies every once in a while, so there's exceptions to every rule, but that's for different reasons. But the point of the matter being is it's an evolution, and it involves that dialogue. So I want to apply those theories now to open data. And, and I'm, I'm going to use the same sort of template that uh, as Web 1.0 1, 1 and Web 2.0, automobile 0 0.0 to 3.0, I'm going to apply this to open data. And the way I look at it is, I think we're, we're nearing the end of the phase of what I'd call open data 1.0. So there was a time when it was all about making the data available. So the, 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 check mark, the check box was checked when the data sets were put up on a website for all to view and to see and to consume. So that, that was 1.0. But now it's a change in culture and it's part of what our organization is certainly moving towards is this notion of open data 2.0. And the difference between 1.0 and 2.0 in my, by my definition is we're essentially engaging dialogue and we're closing a loop between those that are providing the data and those that are consuming the data. The, con the consumers, they can be the individual, they can be, uh, they can be government itself, or it could be the private sector, it could be anybody who has an interest in using that data. And dialogue is what's going to drive the open data 2.0 revolution. And again, because of all this, it's going to create a stronger value proposition, just like it did for marketing, just like it did for the automobile and continues to do for the automobile. 
I think will also happen for open data. But of course, dialogue needs to be an important part of that. And maybe at some point we're actually going to get to a open data 3.0 or a smart open data. And it's been mentioned a couple times by a few speakers um, at the conference so far, is the notion is that the dialogue doesn't have to be just person to person anymore. In fact, the real value, the extended value, is going to come from person to computer, or machine to machine, or, or whatever the case may be. And that's going to be the evolution of it. And, and open data can play a significant role because there is obviously, and I don't think I need to say that to anyone in the room here, there's tremendous value in open data. And that's the premise that we're building on. And what we want to do is it, it's, it, the, the value extends beyond just making it available on a website and allowing a few people to, to dive into it. So this gets to the premise where I want to talk about and go a little bit deeper and, and certainly now start to, to hear more from you than to hear my own voice, is the whole notion of, OK, so we're, we're building out Open Data 2.0. Um, with that, there needs to be a value proposition. Why do we care about how Open Data is used? And then we start to talk about, so how do we value? How, would we, how do we put a number on that value? What's the return on investment? Because my, th my theory is, is that there's uh, obviously great appetite for embracing open data from a transparency and open government perspective to the point where uh, I'd love to have a real-time tracker that shows the number of new net new open data sets that are being made available, I bet even on an hour-by-hour -hour basis. And I think it's, it's, it's probably quite phenomenal. S at some point, I think we're going to get to the discussion where it's going to be whether it's the feds with over 200,000 data sets themselves, or we saw that the province of Ontario now has over 400, there is a cost and a price associated with making data available. And I think we're so wrapped up and caught up in the idea of transparency and open government and being, you know, providing that sort of service to our citizens that we're conveniently ignoring that part of the discussion. But because there's money involved and because there's effort and time and resources, I think that conversation is going to come to the forefront when we're sort of tired of the current value proposition and we're looking for something more. So this is where I'm looking at what's a way that we can use or how can we develop a return on investment sort of model for the use of open data. And the premise being that I see the public sector or the private sector, I should say, as being, being a part of that. And, and so it's the idea that if we know uh, this particular data set, um, let's, let's use Environment Canada as a, as a for instance. So we know uh, Palmerex is a company in, in Canada or in Ontario that runs the, the weather network. Um, so they've been consuming Environment Canada data and US data and everything for years. And now that has turned into a multi-billion dollar industry. Well, I don't think that Environment Canada anytime soon is going gonna, is gonna to say, well, we're done providing environment, weather, environment data because, you know, what's the use? To me, they're going to say, well, look at, look at the industry that that data is supporting. It's a multi-billion dollar industry. And from a government's perspective, they say, well, not only is it creating, it has this industry, but it's employing this number of people and it's generating this kind of revenue, which means the tax base is this much, so on, so on. So then it becomes very easy to make the case as to why environment data should make, be kept and maintained. And I think we can adopt the same sort of strategy for, for valuing data. And I'm not saying it's the only strategy. I'm not saying it's the only way we value open data but I'm saying it is a mechanism by which we can do so. And you'll see that what that does then is it provides those that are providing the data some insight as to which data sets they should be contributing resources to and which ones perhaps they should be attributing less resources to. And notice I didn't say those that we shouldn't be putting up at all because I, 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 I still value transparency and open government, but again, it's going to turn into an economic environment or an economic discussion sooner than later. So we might as well get behind it. And what I like about involving the, the, the private sector in this, uh, in this equation 
is because they are uniquely situated and positioned to take this natural resource called open data, develop products and services around it, and feed it back for the good, not only for their customers, but for the good of uh, society as a whole. And I think it's often seen, and, and I've been in situations where, where I use this dirty C word called commercialization when it comes to the use of open data. And the, some of the thoughts, and one of the camps of thought is, there's, we shouldn't be taking a publicly funded resource and allowing others to generate economic benefit from it. And I would counter that, but the best way to get the best uh, civic engagement or the best uh, 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 solutions to problems that society has as a whole is to engage the, the, the private sector because they are uniquely situated to not only create the solutions but to be innovative with those solutions and to continue to provide the best value for the use of that data. And that's, that's a culture change. Um, and uh, and um, one of the other talks that's going on here is the city of Guelph. And we as an organization are working with the city of Guelph. And uh, hopefully I'm not giving too much away here, so it doesn't go beyond this. Open dialogue to a certain extent, but not beyond here. Um, we're working with them because what they want to do is they're looking uh, to work with us to develop a framework by, by which we engage the, public, the private sector to solve some problems that they've identified within their own or within their city, which in itself isn't necessarily new and novel, but what the new and novel part of it is that they're actually changing their procurement process to allow the winner of a challenge or a hackathon to be the vendor of choice as a solution to that problem. That in itself is a culture change as far as I'm concerned. And so we see bits and pieces of that happening, but they've recognized that if we engage the private sector, that's probably the best way for us to, to work at solving these sorts of problems. So that's, that's the essence of that. So now, this is where I need your help. This is where the interactive part comes. This is where I will call you out if I need to. You've stuck around long enough, but I need this kind of input. And I'm gonna start with some fairly easy questions. So, who is here for, is from the public sector, represents the public sector? And how many of you have your finger in or on or, or a touch with open data initiatives? Oh, perfect. Okay. Who here is from the private sector? Excellent. Okay, so this is good. Because this is where I want to do is I want to start the dialogue between the private and the public sector. And... Um, and I'm going to start it this way. I'm going to start with uh, looking at the, the public sector. So for those of you in the public sector uh, uh, using open data or making open data available, how many of you actually track the download statistics of the data that's being consumed? Okay. So could I ask one or more of you to tell me what do you track and to what level can you track it? Is there anybody willing to... Give us that sort of uh, that insight, please. We can track uh, um, for fisheries and oceans. And, uh, we do from the statistical services and view this. We do track the the web pages and, and the number of downloads because uh, some of the data that we have available um, are downloads. So we can track based just the page of monitoring of those of those pages. Okay. And so, you, you, how, how close can you get to the, to the organization or the individual that's actually consuming that data? Oh, you mean downloads only up until, um, not, to, uh, not any further than how many, but just the frequency counts. Okay, so you have no idea who's consuming it, but just... And if you had those discussions as to, like, okay, maybe I'll step back, would it be useful to know who's consuming that data from your perspective? It would be because then you can kind of delineate further, is it primarily researchers that are making use of your information, or is it other types of government departments, for example, and those kinds of ideas would be helpful to Okay. 
And how many, uh, out of curiosity, how many open data sets do you make available right now? Excellent. Any other perspectives? I'd love to hear from a couple more in terms of what their, their experience are is from tracking, please. Actually, would you mind using the, I, I don't know if the microphone's on, but it might make it easier for others to hear. Thank you. Hello? Yeah, perfect. Uh, okay. Um, I'm from uh, Immigration Refugee Citizenship uh, Canada, and um, we've got about 130, 140 uh, data sets up there, but we're really looking at uh, pushing more and more things out there. We. Um, we have a lot of uh, people from around the world. We, we track a uh, number of hits uh, sort of on a monthly basis. It's a little bit dated right now, but uh, we use that mostly to see which data sets are more popular and use those to uh, sort of uh, aim, target the uh, you know, future data sets that we end up putting up there. Okay. Yeah. The, um, mostly it's anecdotal finding out who actually uses our data sets. We find a lot of researchers, media. Uh, we're getting the department uh, communications uh, group especially, pushing people more towards the open data tables to answer their questions instead of having uh, them uh, being gone through media relations or, or whatnot. Uh, as far as tracking them, we could uh, count the number of page hits. We could find out where, like from what country they're uh, accessing the data sets. That's pretty much it. Um, sometimes we also get comments actually on the uh, data sets. We find out from them what sort of organization they're with. Okay. What they're going to be using the uh, data for. So. Okay. And do you do you get requests? Like, do do people come to you and say, "Gee, I wish you would do this, or I wish you would provide this"? We have uh, received a number of these things, uh, both um, through emails just to our like statistical reporting groups, and through the uh, Treasury Board Open Data site. They have a uh, part over there uh, that lets people go in and, and uh, suggest uh, new data sets. But we're also looking at. Um, the ad hoc requests that we get in our department, finding out what's popular and, and um, again, aiming our, uh, our future data sets that we're putting up there, putting, uh, using that as our, uh, as our guide. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Any other perspectives from the public sector that uh, people would like to share? Hi. I'm a little bit different than many of the people here because I'm from the municipal sector. So I'm from an upper tier municipality in Gray County. Um, we have opendata.gray.ca that you could go to. Um, we make available various GIS layers to the public, um, things like uh, road data, uh, sensor data, traffic camera data, um, various parts of our official plan. We also try to um, be a bit of an aggregator and in bringing information that comes to us and, and being kind of the central repository of that and putting out forward again to things like the Niagara escarpment data, that sort of thing. So okay. early days for us. Um, as far as tracking goes, I think it's just really pretty basic Google Analytics and, and that. For people who actually want to use the stuff, we do have a licensing um, process in place if people want to take it and then f do further work with it. Okay, so is it, but is it, is the fact that you're, you're lightly tracking uh, due to uh, confidentiality and, and security issues or is it just lack of infrastructure to do it to where you I like think to do a it. combination of the two it's as I say it's early days for us and being a like a smaller place uh, we want to make sure that we've got the right resources in place to be able to support it and secure it appropriately so okay and I'm gonna put you on the spot just sure. for one more why are you why are you why are you driving open data why does this matter to, to Gray County Gray County is a large upper tier municipality high degree of it is essentially rural. Um, Gray's played kind of an integral role in trying to drive further investment in uh, broadband infrastructure and the extension of fiber um, across our municipality. We see that as a, a really uh, critical thing for our continued economic development and diversity. So um, we see that as th this is the other side of that coin. You need to be able to support the demand for the infrastructure, so trying to seed the world so people know that there are opportunities. We try to facilitate a lot of conversations around what the art of the possible is. Okay, so you 
it's it's need driven by the sounds of it. Absolutely. Like it's not you're not doing it just because everybody else is doing it. You're doing it because oh, no, no. you see this as providing this value is back to the county. critical to the health of our of our area. I think. Okay. Perfect. Okay, Thank you. Thanks. Okay, and I should have asked maybe all these questions at the same time, but anyways, it gives other people uh, opportunity to speak up and, and join in is, how do you decide to what data that you're going to make available? And again, is this, is this based on requests that are made to you, or is it, is it a part of policy that results from within your departments or within government that says, we're going to make this data available? because I, I, I would assume in every case that there's much more data that could be made available and you need, need to prioritize in some way to decide. What's, how, how are you know, either cities, municipalities, or whatever choosing to make data available? Please. Uh, I guess for us, uh, I work in the uh, access to information privacy field uh, with uh, fisheries and oceans. So for us, it's a little bit difficult sometimes in terms of determining what we can and can't make public. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the interesting things was actually recently with, um, you know, when the new government came in and all the briefing binders, there was a lot of kind of internal discussion about proactively posting information and so forth. But I mean, from our field, there's always going to be those kind of risks involved. And uh, now I think it's a really interesting time to be in the field, especially with, you know, the uh, announcements yesterday about uh, changes to the act. And also there's been a lot of discussion, you know, open government about proactively posting briefings notes uh, possibly online but I mean we're still kind of handcuffed I guess a little bit by the legislation and that's one thing I find quite frustrating and I don't know if there's ever people here potentially in the same industry who feel that way um, so I'm always looking at new potential ways to make data a lot more open and information a lot more open um, now there's been a lot of transition though over to you know opencanada.ca yes. and a lot of the information we do is kind of tracked more by Treasury Board so it's a little bit harder for us to know how many people are you know looking at um, completed access requests uh, on their website things like that so so you said frustrated by legislation well yeah what does I, that mean well I feel that it's just that we're we're kind of bound by antiquated piece of legislation right where there's a lot more information that I feel should be openly uh, you know openly available to the Canadian public but you know like I said case in point with the briefing binders there was tons and tons of internal chatter across you know a number of different um, number of different departments in regards to how we could actually put those out there because there's always going to be potential cabinet confidence issues and things like that so even though there is sometimes a lot of push to try and make data more open sometimes we're still hitting these kind of roadblocks based on as I said old pieces of legislation and kind of I guess the, the general culture within government that is maybe not a hundred percent ready to make this, this shift towards more open government there still seems to be in the background a little bit of kind of fear from from some individuals that I that I've kind of encountered about we want to do this, but we're still not maybe 100% ready. And I think that's why conferences like this are great to kind of show that it can be done if we do it correctly and, and we engage people in the, in the appropriate manner. And do you think that you're engaged with, the, in, from a dialogue perspective, are the right stakeholders at the table in order to make that change happen? Or does there, do you need to widen the net, if I may use a terrible well, pun? I, I think it's, I think we're definitely getting it from, from up top, but I feel that we're still a lot of the individuals, and this is what's interesting, is that there's a lot of push from, you know, senior officials saying this is where we want to move, and especially that's the message from the, from the new incoming government, but I feel it's a lot of the kind of individuals who are working on the ground, and especially from an ATIP perspective, we get a lot of, of, of kind of fight, I guess, with program officials, because this is, this is their bread and butter. This is their, their baby sometimes, a project they're working on, and they're very, very nervous, I guess, about releasing that, and especially Fisheries and Ocean, a department where there was issues with muzzling of scientists, and then across other areas of government, there was always a little bit of that nervousness. So it's, it's difficult sometimes to engage and to, and to have that open dialogue, but we're doing it a lot more by trying to uh, put together new initiatives in the, in the department to kind of modernize our shop, and you know, hopefully now with Treasury Board getting a little bit more funding and trying to look for ways it's going to hopefully kind of revolutionize the, the access field, because a lot of other governments around the world have taken Taken steps to kind of move a tip forward so okay I don't want to take too much time great here, no so. thank you for the feedback You're welcome. others in terms of how you make how do you prioritize data that you make available please 
Hi, uh, I'm Trevor Penny with Natural Resources Canada. Uh, we actually have a lot of stuff in open data, a couple hundred thousand records mm -hmm. or something. Um, a lot of discussions lately that have been coming up with, mostly everything's open. Uh, part of what it, we discuss a lot is making it open is grouping it together in the right way. A lot of discussions come up around that because we could either have 200,000 entries in open data or we could have one. You know, it's sort of making that choice. Um, but a lot of discussions have recently been coming around the idea of um, duty of care to... There's a lot of concern about misunderstanding what the data is trying to say and that people trying to make sure that we're giving enough information to people to understand how they could use it or should be using it and how maybe they shouldn't be using it because it's easy sometimes for people to download something and automatically assume that it's 100% information. For example, like we work in, um, I work in the legal surveys division uh, with uh, legal land boundaries and we capture a GIS of all the cadastral infrastructure of all Canada lands. The GIS itself is a tool to help index, discover, and work on that, but it's not legal boundaries. The official survey records are the legal boundaries, but it would be easy to download the data set of all the legal boundaries, put them on a map, and say, oh, well, there's, there's the boundary right there. That's what it is, but it, it's not. And so there's a lot of discussions around how do we make sure we're doing our duty of care to make sure that people understand what they're getting and what they should and shouldn't be using it for. Okay. And that's where a lot of discussions are coming around. Okay. And that's right where the dialogue needs to I guess, yeah, itself, and, and right? how do we explain that? Because, like, we know that a lot of, I was working on the, F, the FGP project, I don't know, Federal Geospatial Platform okay. project. And, you know, we, we're looking at the, the open government license there, and it's, you know, really the requirement to be on open data is have the license. And we have these discussions, like, we want to say, you know, not to be used to define legisl legal legislative boundaries. And they're like, well, that's not really part of the license, that's more of a duty of care thing, but there's no place in open data for a duty of care sort of to explain you should not do this, here's what you could or could not use it for. You know? okay. Trying to explain, because we don't want people to get and misunderstand and suddenly you're seeing report analyses that are using data in a way that, it could be good, it could be very good they're using them in that way, but there's also reasons they shouldn't use them. Yes, yes, <laughs> so, absolutely. Well, and, and I want to yeah. dig into that a little bit deeper because I, yeah. I see there's a fundamental, I think there's a, a bit of a different language is being spoken by the user side yeah, and the supply and, and side. Yeah, we talk about metadata and making sure there's complete metadata. You know, we're seeing open data, there's a few, uh, generalization issues that kind of arise, like how do you make it, put it all together in a way that still you can find things. I right. know that's kind of a topic yes. with uh, discovery. Yes. discovery and stuff. Exactly. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Is there anybody here from StatsCan? Okay. But have a perspective, please. Sure. So what we've done uh, is working with StatsCan and academia to open data. So essentially what we've done, we have a large administrative database uh, that we use to administer our programs. It's a huge uh, uh, data environment, no capacity internally or somewhere to put that out in a meaningful way and engage academia or any other research community. So what we've done is uh, uh, we'll put out through StatsCan RDCs, we'll put out a, a request for a, a call for paper and checked out what's the interest out there in the academic circle in terms of doing social policy research using administrative data like ours. Okay. And then worked closely with staffs can and about 27 universities across Canada uh, to really design what we're going to put out and really see the value of the return on that investment. And the way we put our questions is based on our strategic priorities in government and ministry to see a real academic work done and also engage the young uh, grad or postgrad students that are out there in, in universities and put out some additional resources also in, in kind of uh, incent them to do some more work, work with CIHR, Shirk. So it's a whole collaborative kind of model of opening big data that we did. Okay. So StatsCon is a key gatekeeper about the data, uses all the 27 or 28 RDCs that it has across the universities, and has a very controlled, systematic way of putting the data, cleansing the data, organizing the data, and working with us 
educating the researchers and users of the data. I know it's a long process, but it's a kind of new collaborative model that we did uh, through the support of our open government initiated in Ontario government. Okay, but it sounds like it results in better outcomes. Uh, it, it is all defined in so terms of result, uh, yeah, return on investment. Yeah, it, it is targeted, it is, uh, I mean, I think it, it, it has a purpose in the way we put it out. Uh, if we were just to dump it on some kind of portal, uh, I mean, the kind of questions that were raised would be interesting questions, but it's, it's a different approach. Okay, great, thank you. 10 minutes, okay, the time's going by pretty quick. So then, okay, I want to get, uh, I want to hear from the private sector because uh, I'd, I'd love to hear, I know there were a few hands in the room, um, and I'm just going to put all the, uh, the questions up here. I was wondering if anybody here from the, from the private sector is willing to speak to some of the questions we have about here. And, and I think tying into and what I'm sensing is, you know, I'd love to know what data it is that's of most value and most use and how you value that. But I'd like to see us focus in, you know, what, what's, what frustrates you about trying to get access to open data? And is there anybody who could you know, either speak to that point um, or, or other points that we have up there? So I wear two hats. Um, I'm a consultant who's been brought into Shared Services Canada to help them design and implement their open government strategy. And on the other side, I'm a member of a essentially a, a civic tech organization called the Humanity Project, where we are trying to help charities access and use open data to push forward their um, their programs and their agendas. So, for example, um, you were talking earlier about what you can do with that data from an economic perspective. We've um, we've been involved with Swim Guide. So Swim Guide, they take open data, well actually no, at this point it's not open data. They take data um, on the water quality at beaches. So if you are intending to go to the beach one day, you go onto their website and you can see if the water is safe that day. They've actually been able to identify how much um, economic loss is attributed to people not going to the beaches under the assumption that the water isn't safe to okay. swim in. So it's an easy case to make. Now, in their case, with that access to open data, they're cobbling data the best they can. And that includes, in some cases, calling up the lifeguard, having volunteers call up the lifeguard to say, hey, what are the water levels? So they're crowdsourcing so, it in many ways, right? Exactly, exactly. They had access to open data. Um, their website becomes more accurate. They can add more beaches. It's more real time. So we've been working with, with nonprofits to make use. Now, in terms of your questions about my, what frustrates me, I mean, there is the, the availability of data or the amount of data. But beyond that, I think it's, you know, it's one thing to say that your data is there, um, but if you visited open, the, the open data portal, the information isn't exactly user-friendly and it's not searchable. You can't just go in there and play around. It's not laid out that way. You also have people who, and this is both in the public sector and the nonprofit sector, you may not necessarily know how to analyze that data. How do you draw insight from that right. data? What do you do with it? I mean, data visualization is a big challenge. So I think it's, you know, putting the data out there is one thing, but then enabling people to know what to do with it. And this is a, you know, this is a challenge that, that human IT is going to have in our, our attempt to help charities. But you know, it's that whole drawing of the insight or, or knowing what to do with it to, to create your apps or whatever it is. Okay, great, thank you. I'm in the private sector, but do a lot of uh, policy work. And my, first, my frustration, this applies less to um, physical science data, so natural resources or fisheries. Mine is more in the social data, and the problem isn't so much, so we'll use stats, uh, thank God that there's a long form census again, or all for science, but, so we use a lot of the census data for, for our research um, to know uh, what the population looks like, but in terms of actually policy development, social policy, my frustration isn't in accessing data, it's in that most of the data that's created is based on old understandings of policy. So the okay. data you can access isn't, and, 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 and what happens then, and this is my worry with students accessing all that data, and we've tried several times to get with, with different groups I work with nationally to get StatsCan to reimagine how they categorize that group or what's interesting about this policy area. 
is that students get this and they get the same old understanding, right? So one of the easiest ways of saying that is when you're always tracking single women or single mothers, but not tracking, for instance, um, male compliance or, or male attachment to parenting, right? That that's the way you keep seeing the problem. So a lot of the social data that I find is created, even if we can access it, is based on old, old conceptions and old policy understandings that don't help us then understand how to move forward on some problem. Um, so, and I don't know where you get to, how do we open up the data in terms of how we define what's worth measuring in the first place, right? right. Because then everyone's stuck with, the, with whatever the way government used to understand everything. Everyone who can even access that data is stuck with that understanding. And that understanding is very often not helpful for solving the kind of issues um, that we're faced with now. So my, I guess my frustration is how do we open up what is worth measuring and what data is worth creating that's going to be useful for solving the problems we know we have. So it's, uh, it's almost starts, it starts obviously with problem definition use perspective and then working your way back the supply yeah, chain and identifying. With, with the pre-research decisions about who gets to help decide how to, to what data, because something's only valuable once it's visible and you make it visible by measuring it, yes. right? You create it, it's not like it's out there to measure. Um, you create it when you measure it, right? And so my frustration is, is that even all this data we can access now is not ways of understanding that are going to solve the very problems we have now, okay. right? So how do we open up the other side, uh, which I have found remarkably closed in the different groups I use? Um, I have just found them not, you know, even informal, very formal parliamentary kind of dealing with them. They're not open. So okay. That's Okay, great. Thank you. Is there a hand back here? We've got time for probably one more comment, and we've got uh, just a few minutes left. Jerry? Okay. Uh, hi, so I'm, uh, I'm from Mass Discovery District, so we're technically a private sector organization, even though most people think we're government. Uh, we're a nonprofit. Uh, we work with startups and we do a lot of work around trying to unlock the systems, the industries, uh, all the various different barriers that get put up, either through policy or through industrial norms. So our frustration, oh, well, so I shouldn't start frustration. First of all, I want to say that actually there's a lot of really good data out there and I thank everyone, all the government departments, uh, for all the great work in putting all that data out there. And I would say that the, the data availability has really increased by leaps and bounds across the board, both at the federal, provincial and the municipal level. So our main frustration really is the linking port linking the data together. Because as the data sets are put out, out there right now, they tend to cover fairly specific issues. And perhaps it is because of the unique nature of the kind of work we've, we do, which is trying to make sense of what's happening in the system, trying to tell a story around how fundings are flowing or how various different investments are flowing through a system or how information is flowing through a system. Perhaps we might be one of the unique entities that look at the system this way uh, and therefore have the need to look at multiple different types of data sets, particularly in the business sector, in the technology areas, in the industry, Canada type of areas to try and link multiple data sets together. So for example, um, how do we know where all those small medium enterprises are that started five years ago? versus now, how are they doing, right. longitudinally speaking, and what contributed to their success, what contributed to their failure, right? So very, very interesting question to ask. So one might say, hey, you're Mars, why are you doing this? There should be someone else smarter than you guys doing this, but the fact of the matter is that no one else is really doing that, and we seem to be, right now, the only people who care. So coming back, I think, I mean, I should say frustration, We've, we're finding that the huge gap right now is providing enough uh, identifiers for data that are really not private, that are actually public data. So business registration data, for example, is not private data, they are public data, to allow us to be able to make that soft linkage. Uh, and then in cases where it is meant to be private data, yep. to figure out a better way for us to do it. So we understand if it's private data, of course we're not going to access it, but is there a way then to allow uh, entities like us and other researchers to be able to 
do that linkage across the board um, on demand without us necessarily having to access the the identifiable uh, the the identity. The identities that, that is the same. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Just before you go, because you work with a lot of startups and a lot of SMEs and probably enterprises as well, yeah. would you say there's a growing demand and appetite for accessing open data resources? Definitely. I think uh, where from where we're sitting, so from the well expected ones, right? So the the uh, the road data, so the transit type data, the map data, to stuff that are really quite esoteric. So uh, I reflect, you know, I really. Uh, agree with I think an earlier person who came up who talked about the social sector data that's actually one of those really really glaring gaps the business data is actually quite a lot of it's out there it's just it's really really messy uh, health data if you know how to open the doors is very very rich but social services data is probably one of the worst right now in terms of just availability but also usefulness um, but the, those who are out, so we have a lot of startups who are act actively demanding for it, um, and trying to make sense of it. And so there's actually, as you guys probably know, there's actually an entire cottage industries of data scrubbers out there now, growing, helping yes. these startups take in all these data and then scrubbing it. So uh, I think one part of it would be definitely, you know, I think it might, there might be some really interesting synergy there for ODX. To, to really hone in on you know, taking that cottage industry and really scaling it up or integrating it better into the supply chain. Right now, as you know, most of them does it through web scraping, through document scraping, et cetera. But yeah, overall, I have to say, uh, our startups definitely using the data, very interested in data. They will eat up everything that you throw at them because these people are really creative at using data to find new insights. Perfect, thank you, great. And that's, uh, so we're just. <laughs> well, there was one more thing I'm going to say. And since I still get the microphone, I'm going to, there's, there's, uh, there's one initiative that uh, we just launched uh, just to finish up. I think it should be relevant to, to everyone. It's called the Open Data 150 initiative. And it's based off of um, the U.S. started what was called the Open Data 500. And the whole basis of these open data initiatives is to, ice, or is to identify companies that are using open data and the kinds of data that they're using in order to draw that connection between the supply and the demand side. So it's, it's essentially a research project right now. We've kicked it off. If you, if you Google Open Data 500 or OD 500, it'll come up. I think there are six or seven countries that are participating. Uh, ODX is taking the lead for Canada. But one of the things we need to do to get out there is to help us identify the companies uh, that you may know of that are using open data and the data that you're using because I think this, this kind of research serves as great inspiration not only for those in this particular sector that want to use open data but aren't quite sure how, but I think it's also informative in terms of where the demand of open data is coming from and I think that would certainly from a public sector perspective but it would be informative for you as well. So that's coming, we're gonna promote it more but I just wanted to plant that seed uh, going forward. So anyways, thank you very much for your participation, for your engagement, for your dialogue and uh, I'm sure we'll connect with many of you uh, at a later date, so thank you.
where I'm going with this question is, you guys do a more concrete sense of how the world is going to be moving into a rather less complex situation, which is the same as that you expect, and rather use that information to make better decisions. If you're wanting all of that, this is what it should be for you. So what are the kind of things that you would have started to talk about and what really do you want to do?
And then you're putting 15 on that clock. Yeah, I'll put 15 on that clock. Right. No.
Hi. My name is Ailish Campbell. I'm joining you from Finance Canada with the federal government. Hope you had a great coffee break. It is my absolute honour to uh, introduce Joe Powell, who's joining us uh, from the Open Government Partnership Support Unit, where he's the Executive Director. I hope you've had a chance to check out uh, Joe's bio online. Three amazing uh, themes really jump out at me. First of all, uh, his work is international and has global significance. Uh, so it's really fantastic that he's able to join us here uh, in Ottawa, in Canada today to talk about what he's seeing globally and where Canada fits into international trends. Second thing that really jumped out at me uh, is the fact that Joe has been at the epicenter of some really interesting networks between government and civil society. Whether it's uh, his work with uh, open government um, or at one, uh, Joe has been active at the, at the G8, the G20, bringing citizens closer to government uh, and frankly, pulling governments closer to citizens, which I think is a, a huge piece of, of democratic service. Uh, and the third piece is empowering citizens through digital tools. Uh, I, I was, had the honor to uh, talk a little bit at the break with uh, Deb Matthews, the minister from Ontario, and we were, we were just discussing how it really feels like uh, Canada is at a tipping point of increased collaboration um, uh, digitally, uh, both at different orders of government, cities and provinces, but also understanding how interactions between those orders of government can improve services and put citizens really at the heart uh, of, of what we're doing, which frankly is the, the whole reason uh, that, that governments um, exist and continue to be given power. So please join me in, in welcoming Joe. He's gonna do um, a 15 to 20 minute presentation. Then we're gonna have a bit of discussion and open things up uh, for uh, collaboration with you. Please join me in welcoming Joe to the stage, thanks. Uh, thanks, Eilish, and, and thanks for the invitation to uh, share some of the learnings um, from the Open Government Partnership. And I just wanted to start, I guess, by um, quickly reminding people who we are. Uh, it would be forgivable uh, not to know what OGP is. It's a very young organization. Um, we started in 2011 with a group of eight heads of state and nine civil society leaders. Um, and they came together because they felt like something was broken in terms of multilateral cooperation and multilateral organizations. They felt like there was a gap for an organization that was really driven by citizens and civil society demands, um, and one that was rooted in the belief that in every government around the world, there are reformers who want to do the right thing. And they also understood that transparency, accountability, and participation were no longer optional, uh, as I think Don was saying yesterday, they are, um, they are absolutely fundamental to what, what a government um, should be doing. But they also thought that we needed an organization that did not have a one-size-fits-all model for every country in the world or even every local government within a country. Um, they thought that open government priorities would always vary from place to place, and I know that there's been a lot of talk around definitions and so on, but I think for us we've always been quite relaxed that people will interpret open government differently in their own jurisdiction as long as it's rooted in those values of transparency, accountability and participation. And almost five years after OGP was created, um, citizen trust or lack of trust in government remains one of the biggest challenges that we're facing. Millions of people are marching against corruption in Brazil, in Guatemala, in Romania and many other places and citizens are demanding something which is more responsive. And we believe open government is part of the answer to that. And, and there has been some positive um, momentum. So since the eight founding countries in 2011, um, we've grown fast. We now have 69 countries and thousands of civil society organizations engaged across the world. Um, and what they're doing together is really actually I would say moving beyond collaboration to actually co-create individual policy reforms that are relevant to that context. Now many of those reforms, as you can imagine, with over two and a half, coming up to two and a half thousand, not all of these are uh, transformational, ambitious. Um, at the beginning especially, a lot of them were frankly technical, internally focused with an unclear openness dimension. So what we tried to do as OGP grew is encourage um, 
stronger implementation of commitments on paper, so they don't just remain in action plans and policy documents, but they actually get implemented, more sharing across international borders, and deepening the interaction between civil society and government um, to move beyond consultation to true co-creation, collaboration, and even co-implementation of these reforms. Um, and I think there have been a, a number of very exciting examples here. And I think, as Wayne said yesterday, it's, it's citizens wanting more than a voice. It's wanting a role in government. So I wanted to just give a concrete example uh, of what these reforms look like, because it, it can seem very technical, of course. Um, these are some of the areas where we've seen some of the most interest from, from governments and civil society. Um, and our hope is that we will move, as I said, um, to seeing OGP as a space um, where we're tackling some of the biggest um, public policy challenges um, in that society. So we want to see corruption being tackled through OGP in Brazil, in Guatemala, in Romania. We want to see access to justice and reform of the police being tackled in the US and Mexico. We want to see money laundering being tackled in the UK and the city of London um, and Ukraine. And here we've seen that OGP has been a place where a light has been shone on extractive industry payments um, and that could even go further. Um, so what do these examples actually look like at, at the country level? I wanted just to tell three very quick stories. Um, we were discussing last night how you communicate the impact to some of these things, to political leaders, but also to the public. Uh, this picture is from Ukraine, um, where the KGB archives um, have been under seal at the Ministry of Justice um, since the end of communism. The KGB had huge extensive archives on phone surveillance, um, on missing persons, um, on, polit on political records and, and, uh, and other forms of uh, surveillance. And really, for Ukraine to move on from that period, um, civil society was demanding that these archives become open. So this is Volodymyr Vyatrovich, who was formerly a campaigner to release these archives and is now the director of the, Nation, of the Institute of National Memory in Ukraine. In their last OGP action plan, the Ukrainian government set an ambitious goal to draft a law in cooperation with civil society that would allow the opening up of the communist era archives, which were closed for decades. In the beginning of April 2015, the government submitted the draft law to parliament and it was passed in a matter of days. The law mandates that security and law enforcement agencies transfer all relevant historical files to a special state archive under the Institute, and that archive will cover information about the entire struggle for Ukrainian independence in the 20th century, including political perse persecutions and human rights violations. So this reflects a significant break from the past in Ukraine and an opportunity to move on. So when people say open government it's somewhat esoteric or theoretical or academic. You know, I think there are examples out there that we can really explain why this absolutely fundamentally matters to citizens. My second example is from Ireland. As many of you know, the Irish economy crashed dramatically in 2008. Unemployment tripled um, after an economic bubble that was founded on low regulation, low taxation, and, and, a, and a booming property sector. After the crash and the unraveling and the kind of investigation into, the, into why it happened so much harder in Ireland than other places, it was revealed that Bertie O'Hearn, the former finance minister and Taoiseach, had accepted payments from millionaire developers and the heads of some of the banks that he would later bail out after the crisis. The subsequent tribunal and report, led by Alan Mann, a judge in Ireland, um, recommended a complete revision to the ethics system that would require more regular disclosure of conflict of interest and revised asset disclosures. The recommendations were included in the last Ireland OGP action plan, and the new ethics system in Ireland that's now in place should prevent this type of political party financing um, and conflict of interest that did so much damage to the, to the country. And finally, in Mongolia, one of the most extractive industry-dependent countries in the world, um, there's been a recent move to put all environmental information related to um, extractive industry projects in, in open data formats, online and shareable. A huge step forward um, for, for Mongolia. The thing that all those three stories have in common um, is that they relied on a huge role for citizens and civil society. 
um, both in putting forward the ideas that actually ended up um, being implemented, but also in an advocacy and campaigning role to make sure political leaders uh, were held accountable, but then also given credit when they did the right thing. And across OGP's 69 countries, um, we're seeing really interesting new forms of collaboration uh, between citizens, civil society, and government. So in over half our countries now, there is actually a permanent dialogue with different levels of formality, uh, or a forum, or a council, um, where civil society and government are meeting regularly um, to discuss open government priorities and really co-create the, the agenda. And I was asked just to give a few examples. So in Colombia, um, the government has actually set up thematic round tables. So it's not under the label open government, it's round tables on education, on health, on gender, on the environment, um, bringing in non-usual suspects from civil society, moving beyond the people that would attend conferences like this, um, people that won't necessarily be there because they think open government is something they're working on, even though they absolutely are, but because they want a more responsive, transparent, and accountable system. In Georgia, the, the, um, in Georgia, the government have actually gone beyond the executive branch um, and the parliament have done their own plan, a legislative open, openness plan um, to shine a light again on, on donations and political party financing, uh, but also to allow citizens to participate um, in the lawmaking process. And in Mexico, um, one of the most advanced forms of cooperation we've seen in OGP, um, they have a formalized tripartite system um, where civil society organizations directly elect eight members to sit on a council alongside the Autonomous Access to Information Commission and government officials from different departments, and they co-own and co-create the open government agenda in Mexico. So that's one of the most ambitious um, uh, examples that we've seen. So what does all this mean for Canada? Canada is clearly not Ukraine or Georgia <laughs> or Ireland even. Um, but I wanted to leave you with, um, I guess, three ideas to, uh, to move forward. Uh, the first, internationally, we desperately need political leaders to make the case for open government internationally. It's very easy to be pessimistic if you look at the direction that many countries are taken. And sadly, in many places in the world, civil society and citizens are experiencing a dramatic closing of space. Laws have been passed to restrict foreign funding, to curtail freedom of the press, and activists have been locked up in jail, even, I'm sad to say, in some of our OGP countries. So I don't think we can afford to be complacent, despite the fact I think the momentum is with us. Um, we absolutely need Canada playing an international leadership role on this agenda. And I think to some extent that's happened on open data. Canada's actually chaired one of our working groups on open data, uh, but I think it can go much further. And of course, that being said, every country in OGP, regardless of your level of development, has something they can improve on. We recently published our second independent report on progress um, on open government issues in Canada. And I'm glad to say that two of the recommendations of the report were actually addressed by Minister Bryson yesterday, which was to include open government in the budget and to put in place a process of reforming access to information. But there were other recommendations in that report, including on working with civil society in a more formalized way. And I think that would be a very interesting um, outcome or, or something for this group to, to think about, which is what would be appropriate uh, in the Canadian context um, in terms of setting up something a bit more formal where government and civil society can come together regularly to talk about these issues. And to that end, I wanted to congratulate um, James and Jean Noé and others who have set up the Canadian Open Government Civil Society Network uh, and really encourage people to participate in that and, and take ownership over it. And there is now an opportunity to also participate in the consultation that Minister Bryson um, launched yesterday. That will feed in, into Canada's third OGP plan. Um, and I know there are already big ideas that have been discussed here around, for example, um, extending open contracting um, and including proactive disclosure of all contracts and using that data to inform um, evidence-based policymaking um, around prioritizing the release of data sets that really matter to citizens and civil society and, and many other ideas that you'll know far better than, than I do. The final message is we need to take this to the, to the local level, to the subnational level. 
Uh, for me, it's been an incredible learning experience to hear from people from all over the country um, talking about their approaches to open government and how varied and different they are based on the different traditions and cultures of, of each of the parts of Canada. So, so much is already happening. OGP was set up to deal primarily with executive branches, um, but what we realized is that open government, if it's to really matter to citizens, um, then we need to take it to all levels of government. This year, we launched a pilot program um, to work with local government authorities. Uh, we had over 40 applications, um, and I would like to congratulate Ontario and Premier Wynne and Deputy Premier Matthews for being uh, one of the first applicants um, to this OGP pilot program. Uh, and I hope we'll have uh, some good news in the coming week or two when we publish the final list of the 15 um, that have been accepted. So in conclusion, I think there is obviously a huge opportunity for Canadian governments at all levels to lead on this agenda. If there's one thing I would think is, if I was being a, a hypercritical that I felt was missing a bit from the last day and a half, um, is just, a re it's just a understanding that transparency and openness are, are deeply political issues. Like they absolutely challenge vested interests. Uh, they take power away from elites, they put it in the hands uh, of the many, and they're about changing the culture of government. Um, so I don't think you can ever be complacent and think these things will happen automatically. Um, they require fundamental political leadership um, and a fundamental change to the way that government and citizens work together. And it's about being less reactive and more proactive about disclosing information. So use well. I think OGP can be a, a tool, a platform, a place where all the reformers who are in this room um, can work together to make potentially transformative changes to Canadian society uh, and to step up leadership um, internationally. Uh, but ultimately, it's, it's over to you guys and, it, and it's in your hands. Thank you. Great, so we have a little while for uh, conversation. And I wanted to kick things off with you, Joe. Um, in preparing for this, I read this great uh, IRPP, our Institute for Research on Public Policy piece, uh, written by uh, James McKinney and Bernard Rudney. Um, and they really emphasize both the open data piece um, as well as access to information. I'd love to ask you, you know, benchmarking Canada against some of your global experiences, where are we on those two specific issues? And as, as a bureaucrat who's had to wade through hours of access to information requests, uh, I, can, I can assure you there's interest uh, in an easier process from, from inside government too. So we're explicitly prohibited from ranking uh, any country. <laughs> are you really? It's, it's in our articles of governance, yeah. Okay. It's, uh, I think if you wanted as, as diverse a group of countries Like to, hot, cold. Exactly, yeah. We medium. leave that to others. But um, I mean, I think this was something we were, we were talking about um, last night as well. You know, I, there seems to be, I guess, in the early stages of OGP, a kind of odd um, siloing of the access to information community who had campaigned around these issues for many decades. Uh, who really understood it had to be rooted in, in law and legal frameworks and institutions, mm -hmm. and then an open data community uh, who were obviously newer and were more interested in the technology and, and side and, and, and kind of more, I guess, from a sort of hacker background. I think what, what we're hoping is to see those two communities converge a lot more because you cannot have um, meaningful um, open data sets being released of the types that were highlighted in that article unless you have a solid legal framework on access to information, unless you have a, an archive system um, mm -hmm. that is really funded and supported. Um, and I think one of the other recommendations we have in our report is how do you think about archiving when so much is digital? You know, what type of new frameworks do you have to put in place to ensure that we don't have huge gaps in our record um, because we don't have things that are locked in Soviet archives? Mm -hmm. um, so I think the... Uh, the idea of bringing those two together and, and making sure that, um, as Minister Bryson said yesterday, the access to information law is updated here, um, that actually it includes from the outset all the principles around open data that we know need to be there. So you've, you've probably heard the, the quote, uh, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Um, and what that means is you can have all kinds of rules, you can have all kinds of laws, and we should, we should absolutely aim, frankly, in Canada uh, for the best laws uh, in the world. 
Um, and I, I think you know we've we've discovered through our conversations here, and we'll keep working on that that we have work to do. Um, but you need to have a culture uh, that supports that. Mm. Uh, from my activity inside government, I can tell you that I really feel strongly that the bureaucracy uh, really believes that the information, uh, you know, belongs to Canadians. Like there's there's yeah. a good culture of openness. So my own experience with access to information has been that people are very diligent about producing records, going through them carefully. But what I wanted to just pick your brains about is, you know, how do we get at that culture piece, um, where information management isn't just seen as the rules, but it's kind of seen as how we are supposed to do things um, as civil servants. Yeah, I mean, I think it has to come from the top. Okay. Um, so one of the things that um, I guess keep us up at night is how fragile in many countries in the world um, this agenda feels. It, it's one or two reforming ministers, mm. um, a, a handful of officials who really get this. You know, I, I think this conference clearly illustrates Canada is not one of those places um, where it's fragile and a change of administration could suddenly see it um, backsliding. Um, so if you have that depth of commitment from the official level, um, I think what you need is the political leadership to create space for them to do their jobs. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, think, uh, I think sometimes we underestimate the, um, the, the value we have in our public institutions in Canada. Um, and you know, traveling internationally, I've I've heard people speak, you know, quite a bit about the the inspiration that they can derive from seeing places with good practice. What uh, what would you encourage Canada to be doing more of globally? So I, um, as I said to um, uh, Minister Bryson yesterday, I think you know we would love to see Canada engaging in a leadership position in OGP, mm -hmm. uh, beyond the excellent work that's happened in open data. What would that entail, specifically? So join, yeah. we have an international steering committee of 11 governments and 11 civil society leaders. Uh, currently, the chairs are um, the governments of France and South Africa, and the World Resources Institute and HESOC, which is a small NGO in, in Mexico. Um, governments are elected to that position by their peers. And I think it would be interesting in the next year or two for Canada to consider running for a seat on, on the steering committee. So I'm from the Department of Finance. We always ask, how much is this going to cost us? Um, but, but in all seriousness, does it, does it need more money? Does it need more leadership? Does it need all of the above? Yeah. Uh, I'm just going to probe you a little bit more about like, what that would mean for Canada. You know, and, and should we be, I'm making this up, should we be concentrating on, on, a, on a region where we have quite a bit of influence, yeah. like the Francophonie, yeah. or in Africa? Should we, should we be focusing on Latin and South America? Should we be partnering? Let's just yeah. push us a little here. So I think there are, there are many countries who are not yet part of OGP, and we need countries like Canada to help uh, make Bring the case in. for them to join. Mm -hmm. And actually, the Francophonie has been one of our weak spots. And, and I, also in the piece that you referenced earlier is a good point on official, official languages. languages. Um, so I think... One of our, we were very strong in Latin America. Um, very few countries in Latin America are not members of OGP. Really? Uh, but we have a big gap in West Africa. Um, and I think partly that is language. Um, partly that's also because we have eligibility criteria to join. So not anybody can join OGP. Uh, we have 90 countries who I think are now eligible, of which 69 are signed up. Uh, you know, Germany's not a member. It's not just uh, developing countries. There are some big. Um, advanced democracies who have also not mm. joined. So I think also making sure that, you know, when Canada is chairing the G7 or the G20 or whatever it is, to make sure that open government is, is on the agenda and actually discussed um, between leaders, um, because I think it is a conversation that needs to happen at that level. So in all seriousness, uh, also too for your secretary, you, you need to hire a bunch of Canadians, that's obvious, <laughs> uh, who uh, I like to say we're type O blood. You can add us to any organization and we make things better. I, I have requested um, a secondment from the Treasury Board Secretariat, so. Uh, I think, I think, no, seriously, in all yeah. seriousness, and, and that person, yeah. you know, should be French, and that person should be able to build some of those bridges yeah. with the, the Francophonie. Right, if that was a, yeah. a follow-up that, yeah. that we could help you deliver on as a result of this conference, yeah. I think that'd be very substantive. Yeah. Um, so I also, um, I'm, I'm very active at the World Economic Forum, and uh, they do rank countries. Yeah. And I have to tell you, you know, it does push countries. So we're on a global competitiveness index um, that's been going on for more than a decade that Jeffrey shot and now Jennifer Blanke, the chief economist there, have started. Um, have, have you thought about having open government as, as one of the criteria for um, government uh, competitiveness? Should it be? Because, I mean, you know, we, talk, we talked, I think, a little bit about yesterday about the unlocked potential uh, and the value 
uh, that open data can deliver into the business sector. I mean, I, I would personally like to see open government become much more integrated into a whole host mm -hmm. of, of indexes and, and also lending. You know, if, you, if you're the IMF and the World Bank and you're providing huge multi-billion dollar loans and grants, if you embed the open government kind of values within that, you know, that, that's far that's more meaningful than if you have a few pots of a million dollars that, that countries can, can help apply to for specific projects. Mm -hmm. um, because then you actually are, um, you're saying that, you know, having effective institutions, having feedback loops, involving citizens in policy making are not optional, right? They're actually part of of, of what's expected if you're going to access these types mm -hmm. of international instruments. Mm -hmm. I, I was also thinking it would be interesting for a couple of countries, maybe like Canada, that believe passionately about, uh, in this, um, to you know to sort of say, yeah, we want to be benchmarked on this, yeah. and then we want to actually demonstrate the economic value yeah. of open government um, yeah. as a, as a demonstration effect. Yeah, and I think that's something Edwin and others at the OECD have been doing these type right. of peer reviews where they have been bringing countries together to assess each other. Mm -hmm. uh, the way we do accountability is we have a national researcher, uh, Mary Francoli, who's based at Carlton. Um, I really encourage people to have a look at the report she just put out. Um, it's, it's a really interesting report, very fair, I think. Um, and that also, she has a section in there on the, on the national context where she does bring in some of these other issues around um, the kind of business argument and competitiveness and so on. Mm -hmm. um, and I think one of our weaknesses, frankly, has been um, it would be great to see more businesses and chambers of commerce involved in OGP consultations um, because I think they have a, not only as the subject of anti-corruption or, or whatever it is, but also as one of the users and one of the people that demand um, some of these cultural changes from government for their own businesses. Mm -hmm. So I read her report uh, in preparation for our discussion and I was really struck by that same point um, about the role of business being, uh, you know, a little bit underdeveloped, if you will. Could you, could you just unpack that for us? Like you said, having chambers of commerce involved, should they also be having kind of their own reporting standards or their own uh, practices in this area? Is it about, you know, them being transparent in their relationships with government? What would that entail? Yeah, I mean, so we, we've, um, we've struggled with this idea of if, if you open up OGP uh, mm -hmm. wholesale to the private sector, how do you have an eligibility criteria uh, for the private sector? You know, do, do, you yeah. allow, uh, do you allow Shell to join, even though Shell um, has taken the US government to court on an OGP commitment on mandatory disclosure of extractive industry payments uh, to governments? You know, so where, where do you draw the line? Because I think you would have, so you, so you, you would need to have some kind of way of, of saying, mm -hmm. yes, there is value to be had from this conversation, but at the same time, recognizing that for a lot of civil society organizations, what they want to see in OGP plans are things that um, prevent um, corruption and, and certain practices that may be actually undermining a change mm -hmm. in culture in the government. So, so there's a group of issues around corruption, for sure, payments, transparency, and you talked about the Irish example uh, in, in, your, in your discussion. Um, you know, I think one of the challenges for business too is that they want to protect commercially sensitive information for competitiveness reasons, which makes perfect sense. Um, proprietary information. What are have, have you have you entered into dialogue with some of the larger multinationals? Have you seen you know what what are they telling you is are there areas of interest and then some of their concerns with open government? I mean, I think we need to do a lot more. It's more, been yeah. it's been some with Google. Um, but, but really not that advanced. Um, and I think as so that's we- that's an area for further for absolutely. Kind of work. Yeah, yeah. And, and also I think explaining to people that um, open government and privacy don't have to be um, in opposition. Mm -hmm. You can actually, you know, people having ownership over their data um, is not, you know, in a sense that should be part of open government, right? It shouldn't be seen. Absolutely. And I think this is where, fr frankly speaking, why Germany hasn't joined OGP is because they have very strong privacy um, concerns. So I think that that needs to be developed further and there are foundations like the Amidiar Network and others who are doing a lot of amazing thinking on this. Um, but Sorry, what was the group? The Amidiar Network. Amidia? Yeah, yeah the okay. founder of eBay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So. Great. Um, we're, I have a few more questions uh, for Joe, but I really would invite all of you. There's two brains up here and probably about 200 out there. So please join us. Um, there's two mics here. 
um, and I'll start recognizing people as they, as they walk up. But I wanted to ask you um, about an issue that's close to my heart, which is fiscal transparency. So transparency in budgeting. Mm. Um, where, where have you seen some good practices on that issue? And what do you think citizens want on, on the sort of fiscal transparency side of things? It's a good question. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm by no means a, a policy expert on mm -hmm. this. I mean, the open budget survey does rank countries and South Africa, I think, has been top for mm -hmm. the past two years. So um, I think in the end, it may not be a citizens writ large, but it may be intermediaries yeah. who, want to, who want to follow the money. They want to know, Absolutely. they want to have open spending linked to procurement, um, linked to infrastructure projects and be able to see where their dollars are going. You know, I think that's, mm -hmm. a, that's a kind of fundamental thing that, that any government should be doing now. Mm -hmm. Great, good, please. And please introduce yourself. Okay, um, yes, it's on. Dave Fraser from the National Research Council. Um, sounds like your organization is doing great work and clearly you're very sincere. Um, on the photo of the announcement of the OPG, I thought I saw the president of Brazil um, so I'm just curious um, if you could talk a little bit more about your eligibility criteria and how you also monitor ongoing behavior. Thanks. That sounds like an easy question. <laughs> um, so interestingly, the, the lead government department on OGP in Brazil is the Comptroller General's office. Um, and if you know much about Brazil, you know the Comptroller General is the person responsible for prosecuting the senators who are alleged mm -hmm. to have taken bribes from Petrobras. Um, so you can look at Brazil one of two ways. You can either say, actually, this is a accountability in action. You know, the former president um, having a judge ruling against him um, and, you know, serious kind of uh, concerns about whether President Dilma can carry on. Um, that, that is accountability at the highest level. So. It's not to say that um, everything is perfect in, in Brazil, but I think it would be far more worrying um, if there weren't some kind of accountability check actually happening. And, and as I said, mm. the team that we work with are on the front lines. I mean, they don't pick up the phone to me anymore. They are absolutely spending their time um, trying to resolve this Petrobras case. Please. Maureen O'Neill, the Canadian Foundation for Healthcare Improvement. Along the same lines, what is the relationship between your organization and Transparency International? So, um, in many of our countries, Transparency International are one of the lead civil society organizations who participate in the consultation, who put forward ideas for the OGP Action Plan. Um, uh, one, of, one of their um, secretariat leads from Berlin has actually, I think, is applying to be on our steering committee when we do the next rotation. Um, so it's a very close relationship, and I think, quite rightly, Transparency International push us to go further. Uh, they ask the difficult questions about Brazil. Um, they ask questions around whether um, certain countries that shall remain nameless who have hundreds of political prisoners should be part of OGP. Um, and, and I think that's, we need to be held to account because you know, we're a relatively young, small, almost like a startup international organization. Uh, so we don't have the hard the hard law and the mm. history of someone like the UN, everything's kind of soft and emerging. Um, so we need that pressure to make sure that our feet are held to the fire as well. We have a question here from, from Twitter. Gary Lee says, um, you've made the point, Joe, that uh, openness and transparency are deeply political and, and they redistribute power. Um, can, can we, and when you say, can we let it go? I'm gonna take that to mean, you know, can, can we push transparency? What would the process for that be? I, I think everyone in the room can answer whether yeah. they can let go better than I can. Um, you know, I, I think, as I said before, if, if you have political leadership which opens the space, then lots of things become possible. And I think one of our... Or we don't wait for them. Yeah. We keep agitating. I mean, I don't know if anyone's read, for example, the, the AFN Perry Belgard uh, uh, report closing the gap. I mean, we know we have a huge um, gap between uh, our First Nation citizens and the rest of Canada, and I think we all know that's unacceptable. Um, they're not going to wait. I mean, we, we, we have to get moving on, on stuff like that. So I, I think, to your point, yeah, leadership is really important, um, and, and all of these, you know, sort of citizen pieces. Um, it's really interesting, by the way, it's a very digitally connected uh, First Nations community who's demographically very young. 
And I think we're seeing the way social media is creating new tools that are really deepening our democracy, you know, as opposed to this sort of like march to the ballot box once every four years. We don't have that tradition. Maybe I can, and we're going to go to the mic here, but, you know, we don't have a very strong sort of ongoing um, referendum democracy mm. in Canada. I'd say British Columbia may, may be our uh, closest uh, example. Oh, you're from BC. Great. <laughs> um, I wasn't going to comment. I was actually going to ask a question yeah. about the economics of all this. Um, so you're from finance, and you know that we've got all we've had um, um, some kind of macroeconomic analysis about what the real numbers are around the opportunity, economic opportunities created by this openness, right? Um, the challenge that I've encountered in talking about some of those numbers is that they tend to be coming from very specialized interests, right? Um, mm -hmm. The McKinsey's, the Deloitte's, the, um, and others, right? Uh, and who will, are, are bringing, have an interest in, in being, able to, being able to tell that story, and I'm, I, I, there's I'm nothing against those guys. But I'm, what I'm wondering is where we're seeing, or if we're seeing some of the economic analysis that kind of puts the, uh, a number mm. on the opportunity here um, that is maybe more a bit more objective than what we're seeing seeing from research organizations or from governments. I know the Canadian federal government has done some great work around the opportunities created by open geospatial information. Yep. Um, but you know, for for people like me who are working at a subnational level and need to drive uh, trying to drive an agenda forward, it's really difficult to have a conversation with a treasury board about um, about moving things ahead and costs without much sense of return. And I'm wondering whether or not there's much going on in that, in that space internationally, Joe. Mm -hmm. I, I can answer for Canada. One of, you know, one of our concerns, or one of the challenges that we have is that measuring services and, and the, the, the things that come out of data, for example, and services in our, in our NAICS code, in, our, uh, in, the, in the way that we measure economic activity is really challenging. So I don't know if you know Danielle Goldfarb at the Conference Board of Canada. She's been doing some work you know, on trying to value services. But I think the conversation actually goes back to Statistics Canada. We had a little conversation about the importance of reimagining Statistics Canada with Tom Jenkins yesterday. Um, but more, frankly, it's gonna take more money and attention on that particular set of economic activity to codify it, to measure it. Mm. Um, and I, I think we should absolutely commit to that. Um, and, and you're right, having that sort of third party, like having someone like Statistics Canada uh, putting that data out there where then it, and they do very effective analyses of various economic sectors so they know what to do it's more of a measurement challenge so I think unpacking that piece and we have I'm sure we have people from Statistics Canada joining us and James Baldwin and others who have worked on the productivity questions for years I think should be at the epicenter of this conversation but your point is really well taken like the consultancies uh, have their own information and are very much on the vanguard of kind of driving the conversation um, we should then also have just kind of generally available data to support that conversation. And it, but the, you know, the point is it's hard. Well, yeah. Getting data, getting services. I don't have it. I'd love it. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. why I'm asking. Is it, it, yeah. it is hard. Joe, is there something internationally yeah. that you're seeing? You know, ironically, Germany has some of the best yeah. services and foreign direct investment data. And so we've got some work to do with their statistical agency and others to kind of mirror what they're doing. Uh, I mean, I feel one of the biggest general gaps for open government is our, we, we are still searching for some of the best, some of the stories of impact, or even mm -hmm. if it's not impact, because people get very queasy about impact, but like early results, or we need to be able to have some shared stories and a narrative where we can talk about these issues in a way that is convincing um, for different mm -hmm. audiences. And one of those audiences will be the, the finance ministry. Uh, another of those audiences will be um, obviously citizens and, and civil society. Um, so I think, you know, if there's something that could also come out of this, of this gathering is if there were a way of collecting um, some of the different examples that are happening across Canada and be able to share them, I think that would be a big step forward uh, mm -hmm. because I, I certainly feel like we're clinging on to a few of the same examples, the McKinsey Report uh, and others, um, and we could do much better. Mm -hmm. Is there something driving your concern in British Columbia? Is there, is there an area of focus or? Well, I, I mean, I just think it's, um, well, there's a, a president of the Treasury Board right there, right? So here's, here's the, real, the real conversation is how, how, much, how much will this cost and is the juice worth the squeeze? And as a, on the public service side, if we're, if we're, if we're wishy-washy, you've probably been there. If you're wishy-washy mm -hmm. about what, what that looks like, it's probably gonna be no sale. Yep. 
So, um, so it's a really important component of um, the sustainability of this work in, in, in meeting its potential because what will happen is, is we will go through a startup phase where we're bootstrapping this and we're using existing resources, but we will become less and less um, relevant and targeted as, pol as politi uh, yeah, and, and we'll get stalled there unless we're able to develop um, a narrative and some real data points about whether the kind of impact that we're going to have. So, you know, like, w w like if it's not, not the right kind of analogy, but, you know, like we can measure the, the economic efficiency created by a tax credit, right, or, or a regulatory, re regulatory relief. Like, can we figure mm -hmm. out the model that allows us to see what sort of transaction costs drop when we're releasing this inform information for businesses and others and then, you know, it's model out the economic impact of something like that. Mm -hmm. So that's Great. all. Thanks. Sounds like we need StatsCan. Um, do we have any StatsCan folks in the room? If you if you're here, uh, and all, and and if you're not, I'm going to just you know call you at home. So, uh, but we we should we should be thinking about what pilots uh, we can drive on this. And and I think we probably have some. I saw Toby Nussbaum here from from the city of Ottawa. I think we probably have some pretty concrete um, examples at the city level, which are a little bit easier to wrap our our, our hands around, and then I think um, we can work with Waterloo um, and and some of their uh, open data work um, to at least model out some pilots. I think that's totally doable. Yeah. So, Hi. on this question, uh, the the government of Mexico uh, has actually asked the OECD to look at the impact of open government data and to try to measure that. And so we're looking at both economic right. as well as governance and social impacts. But and it is. Are you very looking at it in a sector or macro, or tell us a little well, bit about your study? So what we've done is we've, we've, we've had um, uh, groups with private sector uh, where we're asking them what is the reuse and what is the value of the reuse of that data. So it's, you know, what, we've, what we're trying to do is to, to test a framework in Mexico that we can then look at other countries as well. Yeah. But what we're finding is that there are big gaps and that there's some kind of heroic assumptions that we have to make in order, but at least it can give us sort of a, a sense, start. a start, yeah. it's a starting point, exactly. And what we've seen there is that um, uh, the, because it's the presidencia, it's the, you know, the head of the national government strategy, the digital strategy that's asking for this, they're the ones that are able to provide the, the leadership and to bring people Open. to the table. Because yeah, otherwise, so. this is not something that a couple of experts in a room are going to be able to figure out. You have to have a broad discussion because you have to search out the people who are doing the reuse, and that's the only way you're going to be able to get that estimate. Otherwise, it's, it's really a theoretical number that you're coming up with. But I actually had a different question, which was that, Joe, you made a really good case about the need to broaden membership in, in, in the OGP, but I wanted to know if you could say something about how we deepen the participation beyond sort of the true believers and to get other sectors in. And just to give you an example, um, the G20 uh, anti-corruption working group recently adopted principles on open data for uh, anti-corruption. And this is, um, you know, literally there were people around the table reading speeches. Open data is very important. Uh, and, because and they would say to us afterwards, I know nothing about open data, but this is just something that we've been told is important. So how do you get that awareness uh, mm -hmm. into areas like anti-corruption, budgeting, procurement, because that's where you're really going to get the big benefits. Mm -hmm. So one idea on that is, um, so in September, the UN agreed the new sustainable development goals uh, to replace the Millennium Development Goals. So 17 yeah. agreed by heads of state, and the whole idea behind moving to the sustainable development goals was that they would be universally implemented. It wasn't gonna be a north-south aid-driven thing as with the MDGs, but actually every country, um, UK, Canada, uh, down to the poorest countries in the world, would have to implement them themselves. And one of the most interesting um, examples in OGP we've seen since then is the US actually committing um, to release uh, sensitive police data um, with, uh, with absolutely relevant to the Black Lives Matter campaign and the, and the issues that have been going on in many American cities. And they've put that as part of their, their domestic implementation of the Sustainable mm -hmm. Development Goals around access to justice in, in Goal 16. So one idea, I think, to broaden it would be to say, well, every country has to set their own national um, indicators to meet these 17 goals. Um, how, how, about, how about we see where, um, where open government intersects with the delivery of those? Because I certainly feel like across 
you know, whether it's environment and climate or gender or health or education, there is an open government dimension to all of these things. And that might allow us to get more line ministries involved, um, more sector-specific civil society, as I said before, who don't necessarily think in the terms of open mm -hmm. government, but actually bring them to the table. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that framework won't necessarily work well everywhere. Um, but, it, but I think it's one idea that we've had for kind of trying to broaden the broaden and deepen within countries. I think I think you know you make a really interesting point there that we have to leverage you know frankly as a as a country with with limited resources and choices, we also have to make sure that we're leveraging the investments there that we're making in international institutions like the UN, the G20, uh, the World Economic Forum, and then drive those into this open uh, government commitment. So, you know, I think surfacing some of the synergies between these activities and making this international activity really meaningful uh, is, is, is really essential. So we're going to take one last question, and then uh, I think we're moving on to our next sessions. Great. Thank you. Please. Uh, thank you, Elish, and, uh, and thank you, Joe, as well. Uh, I guess uh, the one thing that um, I've found remarkable over the past day and a half or so is really illustrated by the photograph behind you. Um, it's uh, a photograph of a gentleman uh, taking a photo, I believe, of, uh, of Parliament. Uh, and we're meeting here in Ottawa. And over the course of a day and a half, uh, I don't think I've heard any mention of uh, Parliament or all 14 of our legislative assemblies uh, across the country. Uh, Joe, I heard you mention you know, the, the, the risk of having democracy only for the elites um, and a shift of power. And I guess perhaps building on David's point, I wonder uh, again whether we're talking about in the open dialogue sector, not in the data, not in the information, the open dialogue sector, whether we're talking about the potential for uh, a complementary uh, theory of democracy or a competing theory of democracy. And I worry that we're actually talking about a competing theory of democracy. We've worked really hard in this country uh, and in many other of them, I'm sure the 69 countries, for the past 200 or so years to uh, develop responsible government, to expand the mm -hmm. franchise, to put in place campaign finance laws so that we do have an equality of participation through a system of representative democracy, which uh, I understand is being challenged and I think I understand the reasons why it's being challenged, but I don't think we can necessarily um, have a conversation about open dialogue and divorce ourselves from the institutions we've actually created to have an open dialogue where all citizens are represented, in this case through the 338 representatives that they duly elected. So I just wonder mm -hmm. if I could, uh, could comment from you on, on how the open dialogue movement fits with the systems of governments in the 69 countries that have signed on. It's a, obviously a huge question. Um, I feel a book coming yeah. on. <laughs> I mean, I, I think I would, um, for, for me, open government strengthens democracy. It's not about a competing vision. I think it's about strengthening and updating the democracy that we have. Um, so we have new tools available to us, digital tools, that allow people to engage their members of parliament directly. You know, we have websites that monitor votes and put that information out in a much more mm -hmm. s simple to understand format. And we, you know, in France, they even had a, they put a, uh, draft law on GitHub and invited people to make comments on it as they were drafting. So I think some of these, some of these tools are actually about strengthening democracy, but I, of course, agree with you that members of parliament have to be involved in this, in this conversation. Um, and actually, some of the most ambitious reforms that have been committed to through OGP have not been delivered because they were the executive branch promising things. Um, that then the legislative branch refused to pass. Mm -hmm. Access so, to information in Tanzania, Philippines, Ghana, and, and many so other places. So deepening this out into, for sure, into yeah. the legislative community, but I think yeah. also we have a huge opportunity to digitize our parliaments, yeah. make them more accessible, and I think that's a really important part of the conversation that you've introduced. So please join me in thanking Joseph for an absolutely fascinating discussion, and good luck with your ongoing work. Yes. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. That was great. We're going to head off. All right, on we go. So we have our open ask session. I would like to invite up our co-chairs, Mrs. Matthews and Mr. Waters to lead us in this exercise. Thank you. So that was so interesting, um, but we must move on and it's now time for our third and final open ask session of Open 2016. Yesterday's open ask sessions resulted in great responses and your input into this final round will help inform our draft principles. 
Thank you, Minister. Um, so, before we put you back to work for the third and final time, um, let's review some of the highlights of uh, your input uh, to date. <clears throat> so, I hope this comes up on the screen. Uh, so, as you can see on the screens uh, behind me, when we break down responses by workplace, it's interesting to see our participants here today from both government and the general public rank our core themes in the same order. So that's good to hear. We're all Canadians after all, um, regardless of where we work, and we have certain views about the ranking, regardless of we're inside or outside government. The top theme, according to everyone, was acknowledging the community. And I think this relates to our earlier conversations about the importance of reporting, reporting back. <clears throat> and that's a key reason why I think it's a top priority uh, that we see uh, from all participants here. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, 72% of respondents are public servants. And when asked to rank the risks of conducting public engagement, now are, these are the risks that you thought could prevent effective sessions. You said that um, if organizers were unable or unwilling to follow through with their se sessions result, that could sink the project. And I think that is really reasonable. I think that's what we would all expect through open, an open dialogue. <clears throat> initiative. Uh, let's switch to the upside. What nudges citizens into joining an engagement session? According to all of you, uh, a strong majority of you at least, you'd be compelled to participate in an engagement exercise if you knew that your input would of course influence outcomes and make positive change. So it's kind of the counter to not following, not following through. So that, I think that all makes eminent sense. We all know how frustrating it can be <laughs> to submit feedback, as I said, or work on a process without knowing what impact our efforts have. In the open idea field, uh, you can see some of the, uh, the ideas that came through. As you can see, over 70 ideas, thank you. Thank you very much for participating. That's, that's tremendous. And we heard anything from Corelling, <laughs> I like this, Corelling ADMs and deputies to attend these conferences. I'm not certain if there was too many here. I generally know some of those folks. Um, and I, maybe we'll talk a little bit about that later on this afternoon in our, in our, uh, uh, our, our open discussion. Uh, so that's, that's kind of one. Uh, we heard that. We also heard... How do we reward risk-taking? Well, uh, we'll continue to review these ideas and see if we can weave them into the principles. Um, when we asked you to categorize your ideas, again, an overwhelming majority of you, almost 80%, said that your idea was related to that always difficult challenge we have, particularly in government. I, I know that part, and I perhaps will comment on that this afternoon as well. Uh, but the idea related to cultural change. Uh, this insight relates to many references, as I said yesterday, to the shift that needs to happen, particularly in the public service. Not just to accommodate uh, the demographic changes, as many new public servants come in who are by nature, have been interactive all their lives, uh, but also to acknowledge that the public expects more responsiveness and, of course, transparency from their governments. And finally, uh, displayed on the screen are the themes that are emerging from your responses to open asked questions. And this may change as, as you continue participating in today's uh, exercise. They're right there for you, uh, for you to read. So again, I mean, I think open dialogue is working really well here uh, today and yesterday, and thank you for your participation. Back to you, Minister. Thank you. So now it is time to go to work. Grab your phone, your laptop, and access the Open Ask platform. The URL is codf.ca 
slash open ask. And you'll see that this series of questions is about exploring your fears around open dialogue. And I think it's important to explore the challenges. What are the barriers? What are the fears? And so it's really important that we hear from you about what some of those fears might be. So again, this is a safe space. Feel free to say whatever comes to your mind. And we look forward to reviewing these, um, your responses. And um, thank you for doing that work. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know about you, but I'm only at question four. But in the meantime, in case any of you are quicker texter typer people than I am, you can make your way up to lunch just at the exit on your left. All kinds of good things waiting for you, and we'll see you when we're ready to come back down. I'll come around to the tables and invite you back when we're ready. Take care et bon appétit à tous.
it does.
Sorry? Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to the afternoon session of our second day here at the Canadian Open Dialogue Forum. Re-bienvenue encore une fois. On est tous ensemble pour la dernière session que nous allons avoir dans notre forum aujourd'hui. I'm still Olivia, and I'm still your MC with the same announcements that I've been giving you all day long, so bear with me. Here we go. So we are going to remind you to kindly make sure that you're interacting with us. If you are following along from home, we want to hear from you. Uh, obviously, because of the volume of communications we receive, we won't be able to answer all your questions, but we will certainly do our best to pass them along to our panelists. N'oubliez pas et n'hésitez pas d'engager de, uh, de, avec nous en utilisant soit Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, toutes sortes de bonnes choses pour faire en sorte que ceux qui sont chez eux ou au travail puissent communiquer avec nous. All right, very good. I would like to make a big thank you one more time to our sponsors. This has been a tremendous experience for me, and I think I can speak for everybody in the room when I say this has really been a wonderful couple days, early mornings included. So we would like to thank OpenText, as well as our government partners, Le Gouvernement du Canada et Le Gouvernement de l'Ontario. And finally, we would like to thank Google, Facebook, IBM, Rogers, Intuit, Ipsos, the Open Government Partnership, and the ODX. We have really had a wonderful time, and we thank you kindly for it.
Last but not least, I have a new addition to my normal repertoire of announcements. Uh, we have been informed that the o Canadian Open Data Summit will be taking place in St. John, New Brunswick in April on the 27th and 28th. So if you're interested in taking a little trip down to the Maritimes from which I hail, by all means, uh, I think it should be a wonderful conference. I thank you once again for all of your participation and your engagement today. And I would like to introduce Mr. McKay, who's going to guide you into your next panel. Merci bien. Bonne journée. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to take uh, just a moment to introduce everyone sitting here on the uh, stage, and then we'll launch into what it promises to be a very interesting conversation. Um, to my farthest right is Don Lenahan, which who all of you know and has been working very hard over the past few days to make this conference a success. And beside him is uh, the Honorable Judy Foote, the Minister of Public Services and Procurement for the Government of Canada. Uh, Wayne Waters, who you also know, former Clerk of the Privy Council and Strategic Council at McCarthy Tetro. Um, beside him, the Honorable Deb Matthews, Deputy Premier of the Government of Ontario's. Ontario's, I like it so much I said it twice. And, <laughs> and, uh, and Mark Barankea, who's the CEO of Open Text, as would recognized one of the premier sponsors for the event today. That means over to you, Don. Yeah. I saw, I saw him grimace at. Um, <laughs> greetings, everyone. Uh, first of all, let me just make a little uh, housekeeping announcement. Is uh, It's wonderful to see that there's this many people still sitting out there in the chairs. Usually when I go to a conference by this time, there are a few people and a few people and a few people, and you're all still out there. That's wonderful. Because uh, we have lots of work for you to do, and we've got, uh, I think, a really interesting session to get you started. I do want to say I know that a few people have to leave. Uh, indeed, Minister, I know that you have a, a plane to catch, part of a minister's duties. So we will try to finish this. We will finish this promptly by uh, 3 o'clock. And uh, I know that people, some, some of you will have to move on then. Uh, I want to take, I have to take a little bit of time here and give you the context for what we're trying to do. Um, I hate to use my time when we have a, a, a panel like we do, but I think I need to set the stage. So let me start by saying this, is the whole point of this, uh, this conference is to explore open dialogue. Uh, and open dialogue, uh, ideally, is guided by principles. And you've probably heard us talking about the principles. You've probably seen some of the stuff. What we've done leading up to this conference is we've gone out and we've plumbed uh, social media. Lots of you participated. We drew on the work uh, from the governments of Ontario and the government of Canada, work they've done on principles to guide open dialogue. And we took all that and we put it together in a draft uh, of some principles that I'm going to talk about in a moment. Some of you will have seen this. Some of you may not have. But the point of this conference, by the time we conclude, uh, in the next couple of hours after this, is to let you do some work on refining these as well. And what we really want to do with this panel is these are people who get to make the decisions about this. You guys are all the people out there who have to do the hard work of making open dialogue work. So if you want some real insight into direction from what's coming from the top, this is an opportunity to get it. We really want to give these people, leaders, decision makers from different points of view, an opportunity to respond to these draft principles and give you some idea what does it look like from their point of view. And you even get to come up to the microphone and question them. And they will be open and transparent in their answers, they tell me. Is that true? <laughs> Excellent. Uh, so uh, what I'm going to do, first of all, is I'm going to take just a few minutes uh, to go through the principles very quickly, just so that those of you who haven't seen it get some idea what the draft looks like. And I should mention, you'll hear about, more about this later, these will be posted for further discussion after the conference for a week or so, uh, and we hope to finalize them shortly after that. These principles are, are uh, really, we, we, I guess, put them into buckets, four basic streams or themes under which they're gathered. The first one is called acknowledge the community. And really the four key ideas here, first and foremost is what we call right fit. And right fit sim simply means this, it's very important. There are different kinds of uh, dialogue processes and you better match the right process with the right problem. I always say if I could tell you anything based on my experience, that's the single most important thing you could learn. So you should have the right fit, that's a principle. Uh, inclusive, I don't have to say a lot about this, we've talked about it through the conference. If you want legitimate and, uh, and well-informed uh, discussions or dialogues, you need to be inclusive of the people and the interests that are represented by that issue. 
Um, open and respectful. Respectful is absolutely critical. This means that you not only sit down and say what you want to say, you have to be willing to listen to others who are participating in that discussion. If you're not respectful, if you're not listening to others, if you don't find yourself changing your mind somewhere along the line, you've made a serious mistake. You've got to be respectful. And finally, it should be accessible. Indeed, it's the law, at least in Ontario, that it be accessible, that we should make uh, it available to people of all abilities uh, and all opportunities to participate in these processes. The second big theme here is focus on uh, impact and outcomes. Um, in some sense, nothing could be more obvious, I hope. But there are a few bullets under here. Measurement, we need to measure for these things and make sure that they are in producing uh, the kind of outcomes uh, and so on, the goals that we have set for ourselves in the process. Relevance and scope, this is one of my favorite. What it really says is that from the time you launch a process and design it, um, the people who actually have to make the decisions about these, along with the people who are designing them, should decide really what, what is this all about, what's the limits that we're creating. People who are going to participate in this discussion have to know what's up for grabs and what isn't. I shouldn't put it for grabs. What's <laughs> up for discussion and what isn't. So there are boundaries. There has to be relevance, there has to be scope. Uh, that's how you keep people inside uh, a reasonable discussion and keep it focused. Trustworthy. Um, once you set the boundaries, once you tell people what the scope is, um, government has to respect those. Uh, people want to know that they can trust the commitment that government makes in order to actually carry out such dialogues. That's the focus and impact on impact and outcomes. The third stream that we have here, or theme, is emphasize transparency and evidence. Um, publicized, really what this means is that there should be an opportunity to inform the public so the public knows what sort of processes are available what's going on. Uh, they should be informed, and what that means is documents and information relevant to the process should be available to the participants. You can't hoard information, sorry, it's not acceptable. Also, participants should be able to introduce information and documents as relevant in a way that actually has a chance to be heard in the process. Um, and finally, transparent, which simply means that decisions that come from this, that are made in the process or that result from the process, the rationale behind them should be explained in one form or another so people know how we got to the conclusion that we got to. That may come after the process, it may come during the process, depending what it is. And finally, the fourth theme here is embrace innovation and transformation. Uh, this is just good, uh, I think, practical stuff. Be innovative. Governments should be essentially looking to use new tools and new opportunities. They should be looking to learn and improve how they do these processes. That's what we're here to talk about. How do we use new tools? How do we use new kinds of processes? How do we do it well? That should be a principle of operation here. And finally, they should be transformative. I'm gonna, this is a great one to end on. Transformative means it should change us. There is a culture of openness. What does it take? It, and it should be a principle, a commitment, that in learning about these processes and developing them and delivering them, that we are creating a culture that actually changes the way we do things. And that's the thing I really want to hear these people talk about. Uh, having said all that, I've now taken up a lot of uh, the time, more than I would have wished, but I'm going to do this. Is um, I'm probably just going to flip a switch here, and I suspect the conversation will carry itself. We shall see. Um, but what I will do just to get it started is I want to pose one basic question, or perhaps three little questions inside a basic one, and just give each of our panelists a chance to, off the top to respond to that, and then we'll let them uh, go at each other. So first of all, the question I really want to ask is, where are we now on these principles? Uh, ministers and others. In other words, for example, is there anything missing here that you would put in? Is there anything here that makes you uncomfortable that you think is going to be tough for you? Tell us about it. And finally, how far do you think your government is along on this? Are we making actual progress? Or are we a long way from the <coughs> principles? Are we already there and we can all go home? And with that, I will say, Minister Foote, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Don, and uh, thank you for the invitation to be here. Uh, it's great to join uh, my colleagues here uh, on, the, uh, on the platform and have an opportunity to, to speak to all of you and have a discussion uh, about the principles that you've enunciated here. When I look at uh, acknowledge the community and then I look, go down and look at embrace innovation and transformation, I can tell you that coming into the Department of Public Services and Procurement uh, and I walk into the building over in Portage, what I found was there was so little eye contact and uh, it was amazing when I walk in and of course as a new minister they have your photo up there, you know, who you are and 
So I walk up, and by the way, I'm from Newfoundland and Labrador. So in Newfoundland and Labrador, you automatically say hello. So when I walk into the department and I go up and I see someone, in, in, an employee there, and I'll say, hi, I'm Judy Foote, who are you and what do you do? Well, the reaction was they kind of jumped back. It's like, oh, you're the minister. And I said, no, I'm Judy Foote. What do you do? And what is your name? And it took a while for them to actually make eye contact. And what I'm finding when we talk about acknowledging the community, it's so important for, I'm finding, for those who work within the department to really believe that we are sincere when we say we want to hear from you. We want to know what you do. It's important. You matter. We're there as leaders. I've been asked to lead a department of government. But I'm not the one who does the work. It's those who work within the department, many of you here who work within departments, who actually do the work. So it's, it's a culture change within government that's happening that I'm finding that people are starting to feel more comfortable. When I go into the department now, when I walk up to someone, now they say hi. And I've often, I've said to them, oh, when they say minister, I would say, no, the only minister I know is the one at my church. Mm. <laughs> I'm Judy, who are you? And you would not believe the number of employees that call me Judy, which is great. Makes me feel comfortable and they feel comfortable. Then we go up to the 18th floor in Portage, beautiful office, great view of the parliamentary precinct. And I'm looking out there and I'm thinking, I wonder how many employees have ever been on the 18th floor in this office. It's not my office, it's theirs. So we're doing coffee breaks, 35, 40 people at a time, bringing them up for coffee. And what's really interesting is that of the 35, 40, maybe two or three actually know each other because they're working in this building over in Portage and they rarely get to interact with each other. So it's about changing the culture and that's why acknowledging the community is really important. But as well when we get back to embracing innovation and transformation, it's also about a transformation. It's about people thinking differently, about appreciating the fact that they're being acknowledged and that they have important work to do. And I think that's what we all need to be doing in terms of making sure that we get the kind of contribution, I guess, the kind of work performed based on their level of comfortability and the fact that they feel respected. And I think that's a key role for us who are in leadership roles is to let those who we work with, and notice I say work with, not they don't work for me, they don't work for government, they work with government. And we need to let them know that they're respected. Excellent. I'm wondering if... <laughs> I was just wondering if Minister Judy is like Judge Judy. I don't know. <laughs> Wayne. Well, having worked in the public service for 37 years, I guess I could say, hi, Judy. Yeah. <laughs> it's rather unusual for me. So. <laughs> um, well, uh, thank you, uh, everyone. And, and uh, it's great to be on this uh, panel. I, I do... I want to start by recognizing uh, uh, Open Text, one of the sponsors, uh, and particularly Tom Jenkins, because I guess he felt, being a public servant so long, that I never have quite the right, right wardrobe, so he bought these socks for me last <laughs> night <laughs> to wear. So that kind of check. I think it is pretty, pretty neat. Goes with my polka dot tie, so here we are. Uh, look, I, uh, I, I think many of the things that Judy, the minister, said, uh, I would have to agree with. I think if I look at, if I go down through this, is there anything missing? I would maybe have added to, uh, and I'm, I am a public servant, but I, I probably would have added to the fourth one by saying embracing innovation, transformation, and risk taking. Mm. Because I really do think to ma really have, make this go, there is going to be risks that ministers and governments are going to have to take, because it is reaching out in new and different ways. And we know, no matter how well we can control the process of reaching out, there will, there will potentially be those out there who decide they want to sabotage the process. It's unfortunate, but it's part of Canada, part of democracy. And so I think leaders and ministers and, and governments, they are going to have to take 
a different, the risk level has to, I think, change in order, in order to do this. Uh, that would be one. The other that always interested me in open dialogue, and clearly open dialogue is about reaching citizens. I, I don't disagree. That's very much part of it. But I'm also, I'm also cognizant of the fact of, you know, the capacity of public servants to resolve some of these very difficult, complex issues that we face, our country faces. Uh, or, our, or our province faces. You know, we have tremendous public servants. But I'd like, I've often thought of open dialogue also as a tool where we actually can go out on these very difficult issues and reach experts. So it's, it's a way, a, a dialogue with experts, not only in Canada, around the world, about challenges facing the country. So there's clearly, it's citizen engagement and reaching citizens the most important. But we can use these interactive tools to gather knowledge and information that we don't necessarily have within the government of Canada or Ontario or whatever. And so how can you also use this as a form of open dialogue of those who have looked at these issues around the world that we're grappling with and have solutions? So using it for many different purposes than maybe what, how, this, how this is structured. That would be another comment I would have. Excellent. Minister Deb. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I am actually comfortable with all of the principles that are here. Um, there are some that, uh, that I think kind of need some kind of underlining. Uh, I think we still have some challenges around um, engaging unlikely participants. Mm. You know, I think there's a, a, some people are inclined to participate. Yeah, I think this is a way of getting more people to participate. But there will be start, still be the large majority of people who don't participate. So I think we have to be very deliberate in understanding who is and who isn't participating. And how do we actually get those unlikely participants to participate? Because they will bring, for sure, a richness to the conversation that um, we won't have without, without them participating. I think the, um, Paul Bourne said something, uh, for those of you who were here uh, yesterday when he spoke, that has really st stuck with me, and, and that's the power of listening, mm -hmm. uh, the power of actually understanding. Those of you who studied sociology might remember Max Weber's concept of Verstehen, where it's really about getting into the head of people, understanding where they are, not just going out and, and asking people to answer our questions, but listening, listening to what, what are the challenges that people want us to address. When I was doing with consultations on poverty reduction. I would traveled, or spoke to hundreds and hundreds of people, many of whom, uh, not a majority though, of people who actually had lived experience. But one person said to me, and I'll never forget it, she said, Deb, listen to me. People live in poverty because they don't have enough money. Don't give us more programs, give us more money. <laughs> and um, you know, it was one of those aha moments that uh, didn't actually fit into the questions that we were asking. So that, uh, that free ourselves to listen, we're not gonna be able to respond to every, um, uh, every concern that is raised, but I really do think we need to figure a way to go quite a bit deeper into, uh, into where people are at. So that, to me, speaks to the, to the depth of engagement. It's no longer just a yes, no, for or against world that we're living in. We have to dig a lot deeper. The, um, the last point I'm going to make, on this round at least, is this notion of relevance and scope, that we have to be really honest with people about what the limitations are. Often, they are fiscal limitations. You know, you look at the pre-budget consultations, uh, the uh, lists of expenditures. I had one colleague on uh, the standing committee that traveled around the province, and she just kept a list every day of the, how much money each request cost. And she, she, at the end of the day, say, well, today was a $500 million day. And, um, you know, so it, people have to be real, reasonable about the context in which we're working. And I think we have to be very upfront about, um, about what is within the realm of the possible. So I will leave it at that. Okay. 
Very good. And pass it down. Well, thank you, Minister. Minister and uh, <laughs> former minister. So, um, no, I was never a minister. <laughs> um, uh, thank you, Mr. Waters. So, um, um, you know, I think when I, when I look at the, the, the principles, um, I think the, you know, if there's an element to add here is, is kind of designing towards the end point, right? You know, looking over the horizon, uh, you know, is that two, three, four, five, six years over the horizon? And um, we have the opportunity to really get to full participatory democracy and 33 million connected citizens, right? And we look at the scale of other you know, digital services and digital forums hitting the marks of billions. Um, we're, we're, we're speaking about an open dialogue to scale over the horizon to you know, um, 33, 34, th 35 million um, connected citizens. And um, it feels very, it, it's a lofty goal, but it's achievable, right? To get this, uh, the, the, to this, to this over the horizon goal of full participatory democracy. And you know, with that um, comes a new volume of information, a new volume and a new voice of, of 33 you know, million participants. And how do you manage that, right? How do you have a closed loop system to make sure um, you know, individuals are not necessarily just you know, yelling into the rain, if you will, um, but there's a mechanism to harvest that input, process that input, and you're not gonna please everybody, right? So uh, what has to come out of that is a set of priorities, uh, uh, probably more no's than yeses, um, uh, but having a closed loop, loop system. So, um, so maybe my comments a little more around, um, one, just, let's just keep staying focused on the over horizon goal that you know, Canada has an opportunity to truly, through open dialogue, have a full participatory democracy. And, and we have a habit of, I'll quote Shakespeare, being a small but perfectly formed country, but then we divide it into even smaller pieces and make the <laughs> challenge even harder. Um, but if we can find a way to continue to, to, to keep this sort of effort together um, to get to that full participatory democracy, it would be a beautiful thing. And then secondly, um, in terms of the principles, is um, getting a closed loop mechan mechanism. Because we're not going to be able to please everyone uh, through the principles. And what's that closed loop system to say, thank you, we listened. Uh, we had mechanisms to be able to processes, to be able to process through this. Um, and here's what's come out of the current set of priorities, and, um, and uh, here's the mandates, and through another cycle again. Um, so, yeah. And maybe what I'll do is I'll pull together some of the observations you've each made, because there's some commonality. Um, and I, I really like your point about um, the long-term view, so two, three, five, six years, because where we've been um, historically on open dialogue and consultations is there's an immediate policy challenge that we need to launch a consultation process on, and that may have a six-month window. Um, and that works fine for pilot projects. It doesn't work for changing the internal processes, as you point out, and then changing the culture within the organization. And I've heard each of you touch on um, some element of risk. You've either said risk or failure. I have the advantage of looking over Mark's shoulder, and he wrote down risk and circled it twice <laughs> on his notepad. Um, and there's, a, there's an element of distinction in companies like OpenText and Google where um, the assumption of risk is inherent in the business process, but alongside it comes um, the acceptance of failure. Um, and that's often, when I have conversations with people in this room and elsewhere, um, their reluctance um, to engage in much larger, more ambitious projects comes down to the sort of observation you're making, Judy, around, um, well, I'll get noticed by the minister, and that's not necessarily a good thing. And the environment really needs to shift so that within organizations they can recognize that putting your foot forward and making a misstep isn't necessarily a, a career-destroying move, and that they'll have the support both within the department or within the organization as well as the minister's offices. And, and I thought maybe if each, each of you, or, or whether it's just the ministers, could react to the, the desire, the ability, and then the, the energy to provide that sort of backstop to, to your departmental employees. I think, I think the, uh, the point you've made about taking risk is really important because obviously uh, one of the things that, that we've said in the department 
is I'm not, I don't have that expertise or that experience to respond to all of the inquiries we get or to media inquiries. So what we've done is we've lifted the veil and we've said, feel free to talk to the media. You, if you have the experience and the expertise and, and you feel comfortable talking to the media, feel free to do so. Ultimately, the buck stops with me, but don't ever feel that you can't make a mistake. We all make mistakes, so no one is perfect, but we learn from our mistakes. So we've said to them, of course you can talk to the media. Uh, it's about being open, it's about being accessible, it's about being transparent. Uh, I'm chairing, thank you to the Prime Minister, a cabinet committee on open and transparent government. And when I was asked to chair this committee, I'm thinking, okay, open government. What do we mean by open government? Well, we want to make sure that Canadians have access to information. They need to know what their government is doing. They need to be able to have input. We need to have that open dialogue so that whatever we're making decisions on, Canadians can become aware of it and uh, comment on it. And it goes back to being prepared to listen to what Canadians are saying. Uh, from our perspective, certainly as a department, uh, let's take the national shipbuilding strategy. Uh, for one, somebody said to me earlier, uh, what did you do to end up getting a procurement as, as your portfolio? What did you do wrong? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a golden opportunity to get something right. Mm -hmm. The issue for us is that when we talk about the national shipbuilding strategy, and there are all these questions out there about costs, about time. It's one of the most complex uh, shipbuilding platforms that the country's ever undertaken. But the reality is, is that people are suspicious about it and questioning it because they don't have the information. So what we're doing is we're going to be, every quarter, putting out information about the national shipbuilding strategy. Numbers will be there. People will be able to see where we are as we go through the process. We'll report to Parliament on an annual basis. Canadians need to know what their government is doing with respect to uh, whether it's the Navy, where we make sure that they have the, the ships that they need, or whether it's the Canadian Coast Guard, but they need to feel comfortable because what we're doing is using taxpayers' dollars. So we need to be open about what we're doing there. And will we make mistakes along the way? You betcha. But when we do, you will know, and you'll be able to say to us, well, did you think about doing something this way instead of the way that you did it? So it's a matter of engaging Canadians as well. And I think that's, we really need to be open about that process. We need to be transparent and provide as much information as we possibly can. So, my perspective actually would be fairly different than yours, um, because I think, it, it, I think that this risk of openness is something we really need to explore, and it's easy to, it's easy to, to pretend that we're not afraid of risk, that we're not risk averse, but I tell you, we are very, we on the political side, are, um, we work in a very toxic political environment. We face an hour of question period every day where opposition members do their job, which is to oppose and to critique, and open information, open data, gives opposition parties ammunition to ask questions. You'll never hear the questions about the really good stuff that's revealed, you'll hear really hard questions about the bad stuff that's revealed. Bring that is on. the nature of <laughs> our world, right? So I was Minister of Health in Ontario for five years, introduced something called the Excellent Care for All Act, which is all about transparency on quality metrics in hospitals and other healthcare institutions. So hospitals had to report on things like hospital-acquired infection rates and so on. This was information that hospitals collected individually, but they never compared to other hospitals how they were doing. Nobody knew, even people who worked in the hospitals, CEOs of hospitals, didn't know how they were doing relative to other hospitals in Ontario. So just giving in that information, making it public, has driven fantastic change. We're seeing rates coming down because nobody wants to be in the lowest quintile. Yeah. 
But I tell you, from an opposition perspective, they just focus, and I'm not talking just politically, journalists as well, uh, focus only on the worst. You never hear the stories about the best. So I think, yes, we have to develop a culture where risk, uh, we're prepared to take risk as government. We have to liberate people from fear of that. But at the same time, I think we need to educate journalists and others about, about how to understand the, the information that is revealed. Can I, <clears throat> and if did, I, can I just make yeah, uh, <laughs> not a minister, but I was going to jump in. <laughs> I interrupted two. Wayne. Okay. So. Yeah, after uh, Wayne, please. I, I think because it, it's really good to hear. I, I think all of us who spent our life in the public service, first and foremost, this will not happen without political leadership. No matter what we all wanted to do, if our political leaders aren't there, governments will not be open. It has to begin. The political, political leadership, as we heard from Minister Wynne this morning. She's committed to Premier. open government. Premier, sorry. What did I say? Minister. So, Premier Wynne. She is open. She's very much a supporter of open government, and that is the beginning of a cultural change. Mm -hmm. But, you know, and I, you know, look, I, I, I'm part of this, but that's, that's necessary. It's not sufficient. It's not sufficient because we've created in Canada, at least at the federal level, a public service that's so rules-bound that even though you say, let's be open, we're living every day by procurement, financial, HR rules. We have checkers checking checkers. Uh, we have 13 agents of parliament and other, other like bodies who are watching over us every single hour of the day. How can you be innovative and open and transparent and take this on when you feel, if I'm doing something, I'm breaking a rule. Mm -hmm. This has to end. <laughs> and I'm partly responsible. I was a senior public servant <laughs> who lived through that. But you know, if you go back, I think you go back to sponsorship, where you know, we lost the government on a management failure. We began to put new rules in. And then another government came along and said, hey, I have this thing called the Federal Accountability Act. I got some other more ideas for rules. So this has to be dealt with at the same time. Otherwise, the public service will not be able to follow what sometimes now where we're seeing our political leaders are. Mark. Oh, I think that was ex extremely well said. I, it's, um, I mean, this, this, this comes down to, and I, I speak from the private sector side, so uh, it's hard for me to um, completely understand all the rocks you carry in your backpacks every day. <laughs> I guess I carry maybe a different set of rocks in my backpack. but. Um, you know, innovation really has three core elements. It takes capital, it takes talent, and it takes a certain cultural element. Right. And on the cultural side, you know, to quote uh, Peter Drucker, um, you know, culture eats strategy for breakfast every morning. Mm -hmm. and, um, and we can never underestimate the cultural challenge um, um, that it takes uh, to, to drive massive change. And uh, I've heard this you know, through the last two days as one of the top themes and, and as Wayne was just speaking about. Um, and part of that culture is being able to take risk. And, you know, if we think of, you know, the Silicon Valley South um, Esprit de Corps and the Silicon Valley North Esprit de Corps between, you know, the Toronto Waterloo Courier, uh, Corridor, uh, risk is accepted. I mean, risk and failure is accepted. It's okay. Version one didn't work, right? Maybe the market wasn't ready. Maybe the um, the, um, the business plan wasn't quite right. Uh, version two, we got a little closer. Version three, failure is actually a badge of honor and celebrate it as you're getting to the perfect product or the perfect climate, mm -hmm. right, to yeah. do something. Um, so, so it's, a ba it's a badge of honor. Government needs private sector people to stand up and say exactly that because we're not allowed a failure on version one in government. That's right. There's yeah, very, that's very little point. tolerance. So, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. So, so we need, in fact, we've sort of looked at our IT and compared ourselves, benchmarked ourselves against private sector. Everybody thinks government ID, I, I, IT is, uh, is terrible. Yeah. It's not. Yeah. It's even better than private sector. So, but we need people, to, knowledgeable people, third party, not, not ministers standing up and saying, what's all this hullabaloo about? Because they're actually doing great. Yeah. Well, it's the cultural element that um, yes. is, is, is as important as principles and outcomes, right? 
So folks, um, the time is ticking away. I do want to say this is that uh, we'd like to give you some time at the microphone. So I'm going to ask one more quick question of our two ministers, uh, Judy and Deb. Uh, and, uh, and then we're going to open the floor to you. So that gives you uh, a couple of minutes just to think about what questions you want to put to our panel and uh, what things you might really want to know. And the questions I want to put to, to the two of you really are just thinking ahead, how do we take a step forward? Like if you had to go somewhere and do something in government that would move the yardsticks, what might it be? Um, Deb, would you like to start? Sure. I, um, those of you who heard the Premier this morning know that Ontario is really committed to this project, and we are taking important steps forward, but we are just at the beginning of this. So you know, we've got uh, a number of projects out there now on open dialogue. We want to do more. Um, and so for me, it's, I think we're moving at the right pace, that we are, we've got some, we're learning as we go. I think there's huge opportunity to do more nationally by getting uh, provinces, territories, and the federal government working together. Uh, we, we, we have the opportunity to re be a real global powerhouse on this um, if we take advantage of the opportunity that's before us. So I think we're moving in the right direction. I think we're moving right now at the right speed, but six months from now, it will need to be accelerated. So uh, I'm excited about the direction and uh, I'm very optimistic. Excellent. Minister. Thank you. Um, I think the fact that the Prime Minister has put in place a cabinet committee on open and transparent government says it all in terms of where we are as a government and uh, how we want to move forward. Uh, leading by example, uh, making sure that uh, when we do something that we're very open and transparent about it. Uh, and I think uh, the President Treasury Board was here and he talked about open.canada.ca. And it's a way to engage Canadians. And if we're seen as a government prepared to engage Canadians, uh, we will see change. We will see transformation taking place. Uh, for us, I think it's really important uh, to be seen, not just to be seen to be reaching out, to, but to be actually doing it. And one of the things that I do whenever I move outside of the bubble of Ottawa and I go to another province, I make a point of visiting with those public servants who work in our department uh, because they are the ones who are actually doing the work on the ground. Uh, we're, you know, we're doing work here in Ottawa, obviously, but it's really important if we're going to look at this um, from a coast-to-coast-to-coast uh, a -coast -to -coast perspective that we acknowledge those public servants who work throughout the country and, uh, and learn from them. So I think it goes back to what Deb said earlier about listening. Uh, we can learn from those who work in the public service. Those of us who are in leadership positions, leadership being you know, a minister or a deputy minister or an ADM, but I can tell you that of the public servants that I've met since I became a minister, they're leaders. They're the ones that are doing things right. They're the ones that are out in the field doing what needs to be done on behalf of, of Canadians. And uh, so I think it's really important for us to lead by example, by listening, uh, by being prepared to do things differently, by being prepared to acknowledge that, uh, for instance, in, in the department that, I, that I'm leading. Uh, we're looking at e-procurement. How do we do procurement more effectively? How do we do it differently? Uh, we work with the industry associations. We look with our supplier advisory council. So it's reaching out. So if we lead by example, then you'll find industry wanting to get engaged. You'll find employees wanting to get engaged. But I think the, that onus is on us uh, as leaders to do that and uh, to do it in a way that people feel comfortable knowing that their ideas will be taken seriously. Thank you. I'm going to pass a talking stick over here to my uh, cool moderator, Colin, and let him moderate you. Great. Um, there's a question from Twitter on, uh, on the screen here that kind of fits into a question I was going to follow up with to your very strong comments, Wayne, and some of yours, ministers. Um, and from Twitter, Nick Scott asks, What's our definition of risk and or an example of acceptable risk taking in the public service? And I'll make an observation first, which is, um, Wayne, you made some really strong comments about the level of supervision that, uh, that public servants feel under, particularly on the federal level. Um, and you know, I think Mark and I can speak to the level of supervision that we in industry feel that we're under as well. Um, and, a, and a question, when we go through 
a hiring process to find someone for our company, we, we try to find people to have an incremental understanding of risk and have an awareness of how do they manage to implement projects within the regulatory or legal framework that, that governs our businesses. And by that I mean they recognize that there are risks within the activities they're undertaking, um, but they also have the judgment to say this is, a, this is a file or an issue where I can push on the risk taking in this project. Um, and the impulse I often find when speaking to my public service colleagues is there's a rush to no, because no reflects this perception that there's political risk that can't be addressed. So from Nick, what, what would your definition of be risk, risk be? And would it be, um, would it be variable depending on the situation? Well, I think, you know, for me, uh, you know, I, I've always found uh, as a leader in government that nobody knows their program or service or uh, if it's internal delivery more than the individuals that are actually doing it. The, right. the folks at the coal face or people are working on in Ottawa. And, you know, what I worry about is that once, as you say, this, the, everything, the, the view that matter, no matter what I bring forward, it's always going to be all the reasons why we can't do it. Eventually, folks stop bringing the ideas forward. And I think that's, my, that's the worry that I would have. Taking, taking risk would be to feel that you can, you know, I've been working on this program for 10 years. Why do we keep doing it this way? Mm -hmm. Here's another way that I think would work a lot better, and I'm going to bring that forward. And I just don't think we allow that. We don't allow the safe yep. space for people to try different things themselves as they manage the programs or to be even, even to bring forward those ideas for a discussion and a debate and let's hope an open debate. I think I started in a government where I felt I could solve everything and it kind of carried with me in my life I think because I always thought that's how government works. But you begin to realize over time that many people who follow me didn't, don't have those degrees of freedom that I have and aren't willing, therefore, to come forward. And I think that's what acceptable risk-taking is in the public service. Well, uh, from the from procurement perspective, in terms of an example of acceptable risk-taking, um, I've been tasked with modernizing procurement. Yeah. So I need input from those who have been involved in procurement all of these years. Uh, I'm a new minister to this portfolio. Uh, I don't have the answers, but I want to work with those who've been doing it for years um, and, and have them feel comfortable approaching us and saying, well, why don't we do this? You know, we've looked at uh, one way where we've uh, combined, uh, you know, a, a systems integrator uh, with a design for one of our ships, our combat surface, uh, sur surface combatant ship. And the, the idea is, if you can find an existing system, uh, then that saves time and that saves money. Uh, so that idea can be both uh, savings in terms of cost and the Navy can get their ships much sooner. But people need to feel comfortable uh, coming forward with those kinds of recommendations. And if I'm challenged, if my task is to um, modernize procurement, then I have to be open to hearing new and different ways of doing things. And, and one, of the, one of the elements on the, on the um, uh, commercial or private sector side is building confidence, mm -hmm. right? And, and instead of the moonshot, right, maybe you go for the, uh, the meter stick, yeah. right, first. And the organization, you know, takes the, the incremental steps of risk and, and failure, if it doesn't work, is, is a fast failure and thus very manageable risk. But, you know, you know finding the early wins building the confidence, mm -hmm. and what used to be risk is now just norm, right. um, and then building on top of those, uh, those successes. We have a question from the floor here. Hi there, my name is Megan Halstern. I'm a former federal public servant now working in Toronto with a group called Civic Tech Toronto that Kathleen Wynne gave a shout out to this morning. Um, we provide space for citizens to collaborate on civic problems together using data design and technology. Thank you for sharing your insights on um, some of the challenges that we're facing. Um, in terms of getting towards this open dialogue. A lot of this has focused on sort of the originators of the open dialogue, the, the government side, the public service side. I'm curious to hear what role citizens and community groups like mine play in um, opening up this space for open dialogue and maybe accelerating it. Sure. Do you want to get started sure. with that? Sure. 
So I, I think um, that's a really important question because this has been a very government-focused conference, and I think that uh, uh, the community bro broadly has uh, as much to bring to the conversation as government does. Uh, I, uh, one of the consultations that we're doing using OPA Dialogue is about accessibility certification. So does a restaurant or a retail establishment meet accessibility standards? We went out thinking that government would set the standards and enforce the standards. Through open dialogue, we actually found the community was prepared to take on accessibility certification. That's going to be way better than government doing it. So I think the, the point you're, you're bringing to the conversation is we're all in this together. And it's okay for government to step back and say, you know, this is something the community should be doing. The work that Tamarack is doing, that Paul Bourne talked about, is very much about community taking ownership and not waiting for government. So, I, you know, I think that you bring something really important to this, just to remind us that, uh, that we are all in this together. Thank you for that. We're getting signals here that we're going to have to close this soon. So I think what I'd like to do is uh, I'd like to pose one last question. Okay. Oh, was there another one? I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, excellent. Yes? <laughs> can I make some just quick points? Um, uh, I think ministers can do a lot to set the tone in a ministry and to make it, it clear that they need the people at the cold face advising them. Monique Bejan used to tell the story that she finally realized that the deputy didn't know any more than she did <laughs> about most of the questions. And so she always asked for the person working on the file to brief her yeah. rather than the ADM or the deputy. So that can make a difference. Um, secondly, in the process of the development of a cabinet document, um, do the ministers on the panel think that it would ever be possible to put out the options that are going to be on their table out for public discussion and then even an organized deliber deliberative dialogue about it? Because that's the part the public doesn't know. They don't know what hasn't been considered often. So that's another suggestion. Parliamentary committees, uh, how they're resourced, uh, both for the research that gets done and also the money they have to travel. I would think that's another place where moving out makes a difference. And then the, the other point is political parties. To what extent are political parties uh, reaching out, both in a substantive way, not, not only in the like three uh, messages a day you get to send money, but in the, uh, the actual reaching out in terms of discussion. After all, going back to the point that David Brock from the MWT made about members of parliament, political parties are the vehicles for making uh, views known about what direction you want the country to go in. Good Thank point. you. Good point. Okay, we are going to have to wrap up briefly, so I'll give you just a very quick <coughs> moment or two to respond to that, if either if you would like to in particular, so that a lot of that was addressed to, uh, to our ministers. Well, it's uh, very valid points, and certainly when departments uh, are looking at different aspects or different pieces of legislation, uh, in a lot of cases, of course, legislation is looked at by parliamentary committees as well. And uh, a lot of these committees, of course, go on the road and consult with Canadians, and a lot of what you get back then helps to, uh, I guess, make up the legislation on a go-forward basis. But uh, some very valid points there. Again, it goes back to being open and being uh, and accessible and to listening, uh, because we need to listen to what Canadians are saying. Sure, I've, I've, you had a lot in there, so let me focus on one part, and that is the role of political parties. And I think it is worth noting that we will still have political parties, and political parties have different visions of where the country should be going, and that's good and that is healthy. Somebody earlier asked to, the question about whether open dialogue complements uh, current um, political processes or whether it replaces what we have. And I think we'd all agree it ought to complement. I don't think anybody is suggesting that we are moving to consensus government here through open dialogue. So I think the role of the parties is to really set the big direction. This is where we want to go. These are priorities. And also to set some specific promises during a campaign. We're going to take this step 
and it's not really a, a, an appropriate open dialogue conversation because you ran on it, you're going to do it. You might want to consult on how you're going to do it, mm. and that's so. I, I I do see it as complementary. What happens with the political political process where we've got three or more parties with different notions of where we need to go. And, and I don't think the open dialogue is going to change that in, in the foreseeable future. Well, let me just uh, take a second to thank our panelists. I wish we actually had another hour. I wish we could go into a whole bunch of the questions we were talking about that we didn't get to. But it's been great. It's been great. So thank you all very much uh, for your candid comments. Thank you to Colin for his uh, uh, capable of keeping the other side together. <laughs> and uh, we're going to pass now, I think, in a moment, uh, back over to Wayne, who's going to take you through the really good and important and hard work you're going to do in the principles for the next little while before we bring this to a con grand conclusion. So thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, do I have two mics on? No, I guess they've worked that out. Okay. Um, well, now we're going to put you to work. So you've heard uh, our thoughts on the draft principles. Uh, as I said, now it's your turn. So at your tables, we'd like you to take the next, let's say, about 30 minutes to review and discuss uh, the current draft core principles. First, do you all have a copy at your tables? Does anybody not have a copy? And if you want to combine a couple tables, since there's one or two uh, at each one, feel free to, uh, to do that as well. So you can draw on what you've heard from our leaders panel and earlier presentations and sessions from today. And following our table discussions, uh, we will ask some tables to present a summary of their discussions, so make sure you have somebody at the table who's willing to stand up and speak on all your behalf at the table, if you could. Uh, okay, so let's go ahead, let's begin this, uh, and the minister and I will come back uh, and, uh, and work your, our way through listening to what you all have to say. Thank you.
So hello, everyone. Those of you who are still here, thank you for being still here. Um, <laughs> the, uh, as was noted earlier, often these things, as uh, the afternoon wears off, so do the people. Um, anyway, it sounds like uh, there has been some great discussion. And uh, what we'd like to do now is go around the room and have uh, tables do a report back on what they discussed. I'm not sure we're got to every table, so we're going to do this volunteers first. We've got people with microphones. So who can talk about the discussion at their table? Somebody way back at the back there. OK, so um, we talked about a few things. Uh, in general, I think the principles are in, in, in good shape. Uh, and, and I speak for my group of my esteemed colleagues who are seated at that table. Um, we talked a little bit about risk taking and at what level of government is it appropriate and, and welcome. And it, um, for us, it also had to do a little bit in terms um, to do with uh, a level of education. And uh, we questioned whether the private sector it truly is a very good example for the public sector in terms of uh, risk taking and failure, only because within the public sector we make decisions and deal with policies that affect uh, a, per, pot, potentially a great number of people and that take a long time to implement and so on and so forth. So perhaps some of our risk adversity and cautiousness has to do with that and for good reasons. Um, we also talked about the demographics of uh, participation and uh, in terms of uh, digitalization and, and online and so on and so forth. Um, and sort of likening it to a loss of institutional um, knowledge when accessibility truly is not implemented and accessible to everybody. And in particular, we, as we look around the room and the demographics of the room, what might we be missing when we don't reach every sector of the population, and particularly those who are, have not grown up with uh, in the digital era and may have a little bit more trouble and may need help accessing that um, venue for, for their voice. Um, ability and skills to use open data. A uh, couple of things that we talked about was the contextualization of information. Some information is a little bit more easily digestible uh, by the public, some is not. Um, I mean economic data may not be readily um, clear and understandable for everybody. So again, educational piece is, is important, but it goes a little bit further than just perhaps putting um, means of interpreting information with that information. It also gets a little bit to uh, what university graduates are, are um, coming out with. And this is something uh, that was uh, discussed in one of the panels is that quantitative analysis um, at the graduate levels perhaps is not embraced as much as it could be. So are we setting up the future generations and current and future graduates to use what we're working to implement and build right now? Um, that's something to think about. Um, institutional change and, and uh, the use of citizens' input. And not to be uh, too cynical, but we had a little bit of, of trouble and look forward to greater clarity on how um, cabinet committee discussions will um, take public input into consideration, how that will uh, work out, and also with the policy making and the political process. Again, those sorts of forces that the push and pull, how will they reconcile and uh, ultimately serve uh, Canadians better? Thank you. Thank you. Great, thank you. Who have we got here? Hands here. Oh, you got somebody? Yeah. I just want to say, as you're getting set up, you made some really interesting points, and Thanks. I'd love to comment on each one, but I won't. <laughs> if you want, you know, no, you're I on won't. the stage. I you won't. Can go first. This is your time. <laughs> so, so our table, um, we, we went all over the place, but we actually have some actionable stuff. Um, Where's uh, this little? Starts at the top, an open dialogue initiative should. We think that should read open dialogue should. And there's a reason for that because as we got into the first point, somewhere in here there's the idea that open dialogue is not, we don't think it should be seen as a discrete thing. Rather, for instance, if you were developing a policy, you would, in, in an open dialogue approach, you, you would run a particular type of engagement at the beginning and then you'd come back maybe with something else and then you would, you would shift to an implementation engagement. There's dialogue all the way along. So you're kind of changing, it's the right fit, but you, you know, one iteration you're using this technique, another iteration you're using another. So it's this idea that it's ongoing. 
Uh, we thought that, our table thought, on number three, emphasize transparency and evidence, we added honesty. Honesty to number three. Emphasize transparency, honesty, and evidence. Um, which is sort of getting to the point where of having the authentic conversation, I think. Uh, number four, embrace innovation and transformation. We wanted to add risk taking to that. Uh, we also had a conversation around how do you incentivize all this? How do you get people to actually follow these principles? And you know, should, should they be kind of embedded into, um, within the federal public service anyway, into um, competencies? You know, so should we be looking at the competencies for various positions and saying, okay, from an open government lens, as a policy person, you should be, you should have competency in open policy development, whatever that means. Um, and that we almost, you know, potentially it's a number five, uh, which is, oh yeah, coming back, that would be the, the, the ongoing. So open dialogue should be ongoing. And that was, that was about it. Thank you. Terrific, thank, thank you. you. Did I do okay? Right back here, there's one back here. Uh, hi there. Uh, we, had, we also discussed a number of different topics, but just two I think I want to highlight from our table discussion. Um, one was about, I guess, kind of recognizing that open dialogue and openness is a means to an end and not an end in and of itself. And I think one of the things, you know, we kind of realized from some of the discussions over the last two days is we often kind of talk about it without actually asking what's the problem we're trying to solve. Um, and so whenever we're engaging into any kind of an open dialogue process, it needs to be solving some kind of problem and being really conscious about what is that problem and how do we have a solution that's, that's fit to purpose to solve the problem. Um, and the other piece is, we talked a lot about culture change over the last couple of days, and I think one of the discussions we had was that while you have to change the culture, if the organizational structures don't change as well, it's tough to imagine culture change really being sustainable. So to think about if we are going to change the culture to enable open dialogue, what kind of structural, institutional, in some cases policy and rule changes have to also happen to make sure that culture change can be sustainable in the long term? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Others? A table of one? <laughs> well, there's more here. Okay. So, oh, yes. Now I see. Sorry. <laughs> Hi, Wayne. Um, well, I sort of hijacked the group because I come from the, I, I am not in government. I come from the outside and have to advise many clients uh, whether they should be involved in the consultation. You know, sometimes you know, these are corporate clients, they might have to do a major study for it. And I said, nothing frustrates me more than consultation for the sake of consultation. And, uh, and that happens quite a bit. And, uh, and, and that's, you know, from someone from the outside, and it, it got into, I said, you got to move all of that number two up. Before you start your consultation, you got to be really clear to the people you're consulting with, you know, how you're going to do it, what you're going to hear, and how it's going to feed back. I thought it was really interesting, the loop is, is important. And then we, we talked a little bit about, uh, about the importance, like if you're going, to, you know, there's that trust, if you, if you break that trust thing on a consultation from government, you know, next time you won't get the people you need, uh, you won't get the experts coming forward, you know, actually preparing the analysis that you might, that might be useful to your decision making and so forth. So I guess that's, uh, that's what we, uh, we spent quite a bit of time talking about is, is, is you know, uh, really being very concerned about it and being honest up front that you're not going to be dealing with this or that. We aren't, or we've already made a decision on that, so don't talk to us about it. So I think it's, it, it gets into the scope of it, being in very honest and really showing how the effects of the consultation will lead to some, something in terms of policy making or whatever. So that, that was, I think, fundamentally some of the discussion we had. Terrific. Very good, thank you. Right here. Hi. So we actually were focusing more on the cultural change part and actually open dialogue within the public service as well. So um, I think there was a comment earlier about Monique Desjardins saying that she un finally understood that her DM didn't know any more than her about the issues and that really bring in the policy analyst, the PM4, that has been working with this issue for the last, you know, six months. So they can answer the questions, right? So 
Flattening the hierarchy in, public, in the public service, I think, is a really, really important issue that I think uh, senior management needs to think about because, you know, we're one of the things that the former clerk, not Wayne, but Janice was talking about was uh, recruitment and retention. And we need millennials, and we, I think we're, we're, we're recruiting them, but are we, we retaining them? Because they come maybe from, you know, private sector or from a graduate degree, they've got great ideas, and all of a sudden they're stuck in a cubicle in the corner, and all their great ideas have been smushed because you know, the layers that it takes for it to get up even to, you know, the ADM is incredible. And then once it gets to the DM, it's like maybe 10% or 30% of, you know, that great idea. So I think we really need to think carefully about that <clears throat> for us to actually retain, re you know, recruit and retain the best millennials that we can get. So, um, and then I would also say that um, um, I think, Wayne, you talked about the public agents, you know, the, the parliamentary agents, I should say privacy commissioner, and especially the auditor general. When you talk about taking risks, I think that the auditor general should have, as a measurement, how many risks did this government take this year that failed? You know, we're caught between spending public money, right, and political liability. You know, and I think, you know, Deb, you talked about that, you know, you, know, you get attacked, right, in question period. But I, I think probably the answer to your, you know, opposition colleagues would be, that was version one. You wait for version two, it's gonna be even better, right? So, so and I think, you know, we're, we're spending our mother's taxpayers' dollars, right? They don't like right? that answer, just they don't like that? Know. Okay. <laughs> but I think, you know, I think if politicians keep saying it over and over again, and we talk about cultural change, then public servants, that just, you know, trickles down, right? Then you get you get you have the opportunity to try things out because you know we can't fail because we're dealing with our, our like I say our mother's taxpayers' dollars right we can't fail it has to work otherwise you know then there'll be an inquiry and how much is an inquiry to, you know cost and all sorts and then there's the media and everybody losing people lose their jobs and you know we can't forget too I think the point made at this table was we went through drap and so people actually were afraid to speak up because they were afraid of losing their job they didn't want to be you know the odd person out so I think we really have to think about that as well so I would say I think that the politicians need to talk to their agents of legislature or parliament and say you know auditor general you need to count how many risks we took and how they created evolution in the program not how we spent you know maybe 200,000 or $2 million, but what that actually led to, you know, was it just a lessons learned? Did it create a, you know, a version two? And I think that will actually change the conversations all the way down, you know, from all through the public servants, and then will allow us, you know, to actually take those risks, you know, so there we go. Interesting. Thank you. Yeah. I could have a lot of comments on your comments, but, Okay, I'll be like you, Minister. I'll hold back. <laughs> oh, we've got another one here. So our table is actually a contingent of uh, members of the Young Professional Network at uh, the Department of Fisheries, Oceans, and the Coast Guard. And we were trying to come up with an idea that was an actionable recommendation that could be made generally across departments, across the federal government of Canada, and per perhaps also at the provincial level. Um, and so we came up with well, we were thinking about what is the fundamental theme of this forum, and it's, as we all know, interactions between government and citizens. But with this discussion of culture, we've also been talking around the idea of perhaps having open discussion within departments themselves and within government. And so we suggested that perhaps departments would consider implementing a uh, innovation forum which bridges, like the previous commentator sort of had touched on a little bit, bridges the relationship between federal, federal or provincial public servants doing direct uh, policy development work or with citizens around the country and bridges them to the very senior levels of management of those same departments, uh, deputy ministers, assistant deputy ministers, and perhaps even the ministers themselves. Um, and we felt that this safe space, for, uh, to use a common term that's going around, where risks and ideas can be taken and perhaps actioned on, and if this uh, idea is institutionalized, continued over years um, routinely, would actually respond to the four major themes that we've talked about. If you uh, consider acknowledging the community, if you consider the community to be 
the uh, lower level public servants who are doing the work of the public service with Canadians. They, they have that direct relationship with the community and they themselves are a community that we should respond to. Um, you focus on impact and outcomes. Um, these public servants have positive ideas that, can, that may not often get all the way up to senior management. This would pr provide a forum for that to occur. Um, emphasis, emphasis on transparency and evidence. Uh, I think that uh, our government right now is talking a lot about how we want to move in an evidence-based policy development direction. And this would be a good space to emphasize that even further and embrace innovation and transformation. Well, that's what this, this forum would be about, would be embracing new ideas and transforming the relationship within government and making it a dialogue within government that makes those services even better. Thank you. Anyone? Oh, yeah. Mark two. Hi. Hi. Um, so we had a few uh, comments. For the first one, acknowledge the community. We thought the word acknowledge was not sufficiently strong. So one of the words we were toying with was engage or maybe involve, um, because we think that what we've been talking about today is just more than just simply acknowledging, like a head no head head nod kind of thing. Um, with regard to the inclusive concept underneath the first principle, uh, we'd like to see some uh, explicit mention of both governmental and non-governmental organizations involved. Um, and f with regard to the open and respectful element, we think that there should be some ground rules for productive and collaborative discussion. So like you mentioned before, uh, question period. Um, it makes me laugh, it makes me cry. Um, <laughs> uh, so, so maybe just making sure that, uh, that, that, that any dialogue is, is both uh, productive and collaborative. Um, with regards to the second principle, focus on impact and outcomes, uh, we were wondering if it'd be possible to incorporate uh, whether or not the engagement was successful or effective. Um, as well as to incorporate some lessons learned into, into that process. Um, with regards to the third one, emphasize transparency and evidence, uh, we'd also like to see accessible content uh, as part of one of the principles under the informed sub-principle, uh, as well as inc incorporating the notion of accountability. So who is it like with the Auditor General, that's a great example. Um, how are we holding people to, or organizations or the public sector to account, and uh, what principles are, are we using for that accountability? Um, and then we would echo one of the previous uh, recommendations for the fourth principle, embrace innovation and transformation, to include some risk taking or some risk management element in there as well. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Any other? Red table right here. Right here. Yeah. I think. Here. Great. Thank you. Um, uh, for, uh, for our table, we, uh, similar to a, a comment here uh, on acknowledging the community, we, we think it should g go further and, uh, and it should be uh, understand as well as acknowledge the uh, community. Uh, and I guess we'll do that by uh, engaging with them uh, closer. Um, on the notion of uh, the same team for accessibility, uh, we, uh, we should also add some uh, language consideration, the type of language in some provinces and uh, territories, uh, ASL, uh, QSL, and also uh, consider the concept, uh, complexity of language, uh, uh, describing science, for example, for uh, more evidence-based uh, decision-making. Um, for the uh, f uh, focus on impact and outcomes, um, we, uh, we do not add something any specific for that one. Uh, for the uh, the uh, the fourth one, embrace innovation and transformation. Uh, we felt that the uh, wording was uh, a bit weak, and uh, it should be more than strive to instill a culture of shame, uh, of, uh, of of openness. Uh, probably uh, more accountability around that one. Um, for the uh, the role uh, of engagement with the media, it's probably related to the. Uh, the publicizing the uh, the consultation that is occurring. Uh, I know we've heard about uh, sometimes being a toxic environment. Uh, sometimes they have a role to leverage our communication and, and be a, an effective partner. And uh, how to better engage uh, the media is something to consider as well. And um, one uh, refers to uh, while we are trying to uh, 
uh, to work on language and trying to understand uh, the notion of open dialogue is uh, how do we draw linkages on the bubbles we saw on some slides uh, during the event uh, between open data, open transformation, uh, or open information, and open dialogue, and uh, more tools and, uh, and explanation of uh, what all this means and the linkages between the bubbles. Thank you. Thank you. So we're out of time on feedback, but of course all of your feedback will be incorporated. I think this is a really interesting process we're in the middle of. Um, just a couple of comments, and I'm sure Wayne has some too. Um, lots of really interesting ideas. The thing that I'm really wanting to explore more is how do we make risk, taking risk, uh, part of, of part of a healthy uh, public service? How do we create the environment where risk-taking is encouraged? And, uh, um, and I was quite taken by this innovation forum idea that, uh, you know, how do, how, do, how do good ideas see the light of day uh, in a hierarchical structure that we have in government? And I think it would be really interesting to actually do it outside of departments and ministries and actually you could do a, a cross-government uh, almost, uh, I don't want to say a dragon's den because that sounds really uh, um, uh, adversarial, but how cool would it be is if uh, people could put ideas together and present them to a forum of peers and see what ideas actually uh, have resonance. So I think we're onto something here because it's, we have, to, we have to go beyond saying we want to be risk takers to actually changing the way we do business to take on risk. So um, the, other, the other two things I'll quickly touch on, the honesty, authenticity was something we heard a lot about. If, we're doing this, we can't just do this because it's the flavor of the month. And um, it's so dear to my heart uh, as a former stats teacher, um, this whole, we have to understand quantitative data better. The more data that's out there, the more we all have to be good consumers of, of quantitative data. And that goes way beyond people in government, it's journalists, it's the public. There used to be a book called uh, How to Lie with Statistics. Uh, I used to use that as a reference book in my statistics class. Uh, so we have to just make sure that you know, the statistics are represented honestly. Wayne. Yeah, well, again, way too many good points for me to comment on all of them. So thank you, everyone, for, for that again. And hope we have good note takers around who've got those down and will help us uh, with the principles moving forward. Um, you know, I, again, I'll just focus a little more on some of the public service comments that, you know, about n those lower down the system who've written the I notes and have the idea and not getting the exposure. You know, it goes back, Winston Churchill used to read, you know, he read his briefing notes at night, usually with a bottle of uh, gin, I think, till three or four in the morning. And he insisted that for every note he got, every earlier draft written by the individual below also be given to him so that he could see the first draft and then the boss who may change it, he saw the amendments. And from time to time, of course, he liked the first draft and he didn't like the amendments. And he knew what, his, what the different folks in his organization, as you go down the hierarchy, were doing. Uh, I, I, and, that, and that was before track changes, right? <laughs> yes, yeah. exactly. Now it's a lot easier to do. Um, you know, the one thing I learned through Blueprint 2020, which, uh, you know, I haven't talked about today, which is the initiative I launched to try and get views from the public service through interactive, interactive tools. You know, a lot of the comments I'm hearing were, those, were comments that were being made. You know, public servants want to be able to interact with each other. They want to be able to use, use these tools to interact with each other. And, you know, when I left, I said, we, you know, we began to start looking at what, what those tools were. And I'd say to my deputies, look, if you guys and gals don't start thinking about this, particularly for our new public servants, and, and they're going to have to sit, as you say, sit in their offices, we're not going to keep them. Because that's the life they've grown, they've grown up that way. And so if we can't modify our workplaces so that they're comfortable, I'm sorry, they're going to go develop a startup or they're going to go join an NGO. 
and you're going to lose out. So if you want a comparative advantage, you better get on with it. I'm not quite certain we got a ways to go, but clearly uh, public servants want to be able to not only collaborate with citizens, we've been talking a lot about that today, but be able to collaborate with each other and how are we going to do that. So I think we'll now move uh, Minister into our final short session, which is again uh, a feedback a feedback on your uh, open ask session. So we think that you've done the work, you've done a lot more this afternoon, R really appreciate it. But let us, uh, let us just quickly run through some of the feedback of the third, uh, third open ask session. Um, I think, and, and I should also note the comment and suggest, suggest improvements online or through Twitter uh, using the uh, CODF16 hashtag is what we want you to do. And our screen, our screen here will, you'll see a summary of our, of our final results and a snapshot of, we'll do it quickly, 12 themes. And we're not going to talk about all 12. Of course, we heard lots and lots and lots about culture change, and it's dominating for a reason from leadership to grassroots. We had a terrific leadership panel today. However, many Open Ask respondents reminded us that culture change can get stalled at mid middle and senior management levels, which is very interesting because we heard from ministers, we heard from the premier, we heard from uh, about the culture change, but we have to be careful that that culture change doesn't get stalled and stifled as it works its way down. Uh, another big theme is apparent to any of us who have, uh, who have worked to initiate anything new in the public sector or anything, or any sector for that matter, and that's resourcing. You need the money to do this. You need the resource, you need the personnel, you need the HR, you need to be able to, uh, you know, uh, uh, you need to have the resources to get the interactive tools that are out there. So uh, ob obviously improving dialogue requires those resources. And, uh, and you brought up resourcing as a key theme. Uh, because in many different aspects from time to time, staff, as I said, dedicated mandates uh, to a practical shift in our policy cycles. The timelines for these projects need to start matching their ambitions. As we plan out these projects, uh, managing expectations is a must. And we heard you loud and clear on that. And this applies to both sides of the equation for the public and the government. You know, while governments may enter, uh, may enter a project with a specific outcome in mind, uh, they need to re remain flexible to accepting the reality of what they hear on the ground. And citizens have different expectations, we heard that as well, of when and how government seeks and uses uh, their feedback. Authenticity is such a hot topic at the moment, we hear this word everywhere, and naturally its opposite, inauthenticity, came up as a fear theme often. From the design and framing stages to reporting back, a fear of inauthenticity can be combated by ensuring that citizens, stakeholders, and staff are empowered to work together to implement solutions after they've invested in a strong deliberative consultation. Uh, finally, an outcome of inauthenticity. I knew I was going to get that. You did very good. I've Why didn't you carry on on this I've one? Here? <laughs> you have to say it. Uh, what, what, so that was also a theme. Uh, so having no intention of acting on any of the previously unplanned engagement inputs, which we've called a lack of meaningful action, is definitely a reasonable and widespread fear. In a word, tokenism. Uh, and now that we know what scares us, we can face our fears. And this is perfectly echoed in uh, an attendee's recent tweet. So Lynn Smith tweeted, as you can see on the screen, who was asked during the conference, am I leaving with action items? And the answer is yes. You are leaving with action items. Your homework is not done. Keep logging off to the platform, tweeting at us so we can refine the principles and keep each other accountable for raising the bar of public engagement. I think also the homework you have is to take some of the ideas and themes uh, that you've, uh, you've 
developed and built upon over the last couple of days and think about how you can apply them in your own, uh, in your own lives, in your own workplace. I think all of us are leaving, uh, uh, at least I can speak for myself, I'm leaving a whole lot more excited about what the opportunities are for us and now we have to put them into action. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. So, unless anyone has a burning comment that has not been raised, we will bring this to a close. I think it's been a tremendously successful conference. I'm really glad that I had the opportunity to co-chair uh, with the minister. I think it's a subject area that we haven't talked a lot about in my days in government. Not enough, that's for sure, and it's good to see the debate and the conversation taking place. So we hope that you have all enjoyed uh, the, the conference and day two of the Open Dialogue Forum. Um, you know, it is always sad that we have to close. It's been our absolute pleasure, as I said, to be your co-chairs over the last two, two, uh, two days. And I'm also very excited and I'm delighted by the enthusiastic and diverse, diverse mix of people at this conference and what you've been able to do to bring this people from across the country and actually from other countries as well. From public sector employees to academics and public engagement practitioners, from experts in the field to those just wanting to learn a little bit more about open government and open dialogue, the conference itself, I think, has been a true example of people coming together to create change. So we hope you were able to learn from your speakers and from one another uh, during the discussion and group sessions throughout the forum. We, met, uh, we witnessed many, uh, many great conversations in plenary and in the various sessions. We heard many ideas, I think, have been hatched, and we want to thank you. We truly want to thank you for being so willing and open to have those fruitful discussions. I would like to specifically thank all the keynote keynotes and speakers, and I could list them all, they're here. Uh, I probably would try and do it and get half the names wrong, so I, I won't. I want to thank, though, I do want to thank the Honourable Scott Bryson. I do want to thank the Premier of Ontario, the Honourable Kathleen Wynne, and I also want to thank the Honourable Judy Foote, and of course my co-chair, uh, the Honourable Deb Matthews. Uh, thank you for taking uh, the time out of your busy schedules, all of you and for coming to share your expert knowledge with all of us. Of course, a conference like this requires a good amount of effort to plan, so we'd like to thank our organizers for, for, uh, for the time and hard work that uh, has made this uh, two days a really fantastic experience. So Canada 2020, and Publivate, thank you so much. Don Lanahan, thank you so much. The conference sponsors, Open Tech, Rogers, Google, the Government of Canada, the Government of Ontario, IBM, Facebook, the Open Government Partnership, and Intuit. Intuit? Intuit. This event would not have been possible without your generosity and support. We told you yesterday that we're big believers in the power of open government and open dialogue, and these last two days have taken our commitment to the next level. Citizens believe it is their right to have a say in the decision their government makes, and we would argue that it's in government's best interest to provide them with that opportunity. We hope our time together has convinced you of that as well, if you weren't convinced before, which I bet you were. Developing these core principles together has been an open dialogue exercise in and of itself, it has shown what can be achieved when we work through ideas and solutions as a collective group instead of in isolation. What can result when more than one voice is heard. It shows that together, through dialogue and collaboration, we truly can achieve better results. We hope the potential of open dialogue has inspired you as much as it has inspired us, that you can see how involving the public and government decision making can help government be more effective, that when we seek and use public input, we can improve policies, which in turn provoos, provo improves public services, and that leads to better outcomes for all. Thank you very, very much.
So, final, final, final wrap-up. Um, first, again, uh, Minister, thank you for uh, co-chairing with me. I don't know if we're Mutt and Jeff or whatever, Sorry. but Sorry I think I think Sorry we kind of, kind of all it worked really well with us. So I do want to thank uh, Canada 2020 staff. I want to thank Jordy Publivate and your staff, but I also want to thank your staff, Minister, for being tremendously helpful to both of us as we've gone through this. So thank your people uh, for all the good work you've done. So I think all of you, when you leave here today, we'd like you to take your new learnings and the core principles and open dialogue with you and see how you can share them with others and even how you can apply them to your own work if you're in the public service. If you can, in your own small area, begin to try and take a little bit of risk. We don't want the dialogue process to end here today. Please remember to check back on the Canadian Open Dialogue Forum website to view and comment on the final draft core principles, and then watch the final principles to be released within a week. And all the presentations you've seen over the past, uh, past two days will be, be made available on our website. So on behalf of Canada 2020, Publibait, and all our great sponsors. Thank you all. Thank you all for attending the Canadian Open Dialogue Forum. Have a great evening. Have a great weekend. Safe travels. Thank you again. Merci. Thank you. Thanks, Wayne. Thank that you. Really fun. <laughs> That's a good job. We managed to do it. Good.